Good afternoon, everyone. We'll call this meeting of the Del Mar College Board of Regents to order. It is Tuesday, June 13th, uh, 1, 1 o'clock p.m. I am going to call roll to establish our quorum. Dr. Babley? Yes. Mr. Lowe? Here. Mr. Garza? Here. Dr. Adami? Here. Ms. Averett? Here. Dr. Turner? Here. Mr. Kelly? Here. Mr. Cruel? Here. I'm Carol Scott. We have a quorum and can conduct business. Would you all please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. Mr. Loeb, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would you all please join us in reading the Del Mar College vision statement? Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive and innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Thank you. Del Mar College will be streaming live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting as may be considered closed session by statute. Now is the opportunity in our agenda for anyone to address the board for public comment on items not on our agenda. Is there anyone here who would like to provide public comment? Seeing none, we will uh, jump right into the meat of our board meeting today. We do not have recognitions. Uh, those are few and far between in the summer months, although we look forward to the opportunity for recognitions of our students and outstanding faculty again once we get going in the fall. Uh, but we will start with our college president's report, Dr. Escamilla. Thank you, Chair Scott. I'd like to begin our, my report with uh, an introduction. Mr. Olson, would you come up to the, to the podium? I am introducing, I am proud and happy, and I think almost as happy as Mary McQueen, to, <laughs> inside joke, inside joke, uh, as, uh, uh, to introduce Mr. Jeff Olson. He is now our Vice President of Communication and Marketing for Del Mar College. Welcome to Del Mar College, first of all, Mr. Olson. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Olson has been around communications in higher ed, and he is an exceptional example of, of that I'm just so proud to be bringing on the team. He, he just began work here June 12th. He has over 25 years um, of, of marketing and public relations work, 10 years in higher education, and he is going to, he's joined the executive team, and let me just tell you what, when I met him, I just knew we had the right person. Uh, he, has, he has great experience. He comes to us from St. Thomas uh, University over in Houston. I understand that they are not happy with us at all right now. Um, he and his wife, um, have um, two kids. Yes, two kids, and um, and I know uh, I'll, I'll let Jeff share a little bit more. But let me just—I want to read it, but I don't like reading to y'all. But let me just say, Jeff. Jeff's got all kinds of experience, and um, including in the private sector in Hollywood and some other things. And 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 that was as foreign a concept to me as anything <laughs> that I've ever run into. But when when you meet and get to know this gentleman, you're gonna see that we have, we have picked a really, really uh, sharp individual, and we are so glad that you're here. Jeff, would you just kind of share a little bit about yourself and sure. or just kind of jump in there and freestyle it if you'd like. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. I think this has been the friendliest onboarding I've ever received in my career. Uh, it's obvious this is a really great and tight-knit community, and that's exactly the place that I aspire to work in, so I feel very privileged. Uh, I've been in communications and storytelling and finding audiences uh, my entire career. And now to be able to do that for the, the mission that we all read 
today here in the Coastal Bend is a huge honor and it's kind of a dream come true for my family and uh, my wife is thrilled to be moving to this area also. So I, I really want to thank everyone for that opportunity. Uh, my background is not really conventional, but I often bring it into my higher ed experience, which is about 10 years working in marketing and communications for different universities. But before that, I worked for about 15 years in Hollywood, writing scripts, producing shows. I did the television show Seventh Heaven, Secret Life of the American Teenager. Um, I've always written shows aimed towards younger audiences, um, but I really am looking forward to understanding the Del Mar students and this audience and figuring out the most effective way to communicate the outcomes uh, that everyone here talks about and works so hard towards. So thank you very much for bringing me on board. Appreciate it, Dr. Escamilla. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. My, my other two items, I'll be very brief. On May 25th, I attended our our monthly Texas Association of Community Colleges meeting, as you can imagine, coming up on the on the on the on the backside of the of sine die, it was a it was a tense meeting. But as we were getting all the preparations together for for the final push of not just the big item of that, that was House Bill Eight, but all the associated uh, pieces of legislation that pertain to higher ed in one form or fashion, and so that was a really, really intense meeting, and um, on June 6th, I went back up to work with Commissioner Keller and a few other uh, presidents regarding some some further in-depth rules making as it relates to uh, HB 8 and the like. We did that at the coordinating board at their new location downtown. My report is short, Regents, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for Dr. Escamilla? Seeing none, we will move into the legislative update. And while Mary is coming forward, uh, Dr. Escamilla and I are going to kick this off. Uh, happy to report that uh, House Bill 8 was indeed signed by the governor on Friday. And Dr. Escamilla and I were both privileged to be uh, invited and able to attend that signing. Uh, it was a momentous day for members of the commission, for our community college family across the state. Um, and um, we had um, obviously the governor there, uh, Representative Van Deever, who was the House author, uh, and Senator Creighton, who was the Senate companion bill author, and then carried, carried uh, House Bill 8 as the, uh, the substitute uh, through the, the Senate as well. Uh, chairman Woody Hunt, the chairman of the, the Texas Commission on Community College Finance, was there along with Commissioner Keller. We had a couple of the other commission members uh, represented, uh, but we were just thrilled to, to be a part of that. So with HB 8 now being signed into law by the governor and with some, I think, just remarkable comments by the governor at that signing, uh, we're now into implementation. And so there's no rest for the, the weary or for the wicked, whatever, whatever <laughs> portion of that, that saying you like to use. Uh, but as Dr. Escamilla said, uh, he and, and we have several Del Mar College folks that are involved in the interim rules making uh, and, and, and then the perm, which we think will be adopted at the August uh, coordinating board meeting. And then uh, the, the permanent rules will come later this year. Um, so we just were are really proud and happy uh, to have been a part of that. And I want, want to once again thank uh, our uh, my fellow regents for uh, allowing us to spend that time over the last year and a half on the commission and on the legislative session. Uh, just thrilled to do that work. Dr. Escamilla? I'll, I'll be brief as we prepare, because we're going to dive into this with our legislative report that Mary has uh, put together. But I want to express this. Uh, first of all, my thanks to the to to the Board of Regents um, for all the support and all the and your patience with this past uh, with my efforts for the past uh, I guess two years basically and since 2021 about this time it began on the heels of the last legislative session and so thank you for your patience and so forth to to our colleagues and to our team to the Del Mar College team get ready things are about to change and so and for the better. And so, Jeff, I appreciate your excitement. He's already diving into the details about it all and so forth and getting to know it because it's going to be communication, communicating uh, what's, um, what's developed so far in the, in the legislation and what will develop is, will, will be key uh, internally, especially <coughs> both 
uh, internally and externally to our to our prospective students and to our employees. So to to the team, to the Delmar College family, we're we're, we're going to have to know this. We're going to have to understand what how this legislature legislation has and will impact us. And yet, as Chair Scott said, we still have. Um, let's just say the rest of the calendar year and really into next year, um, next, into the next ca uh, academic year, uh, things will be developing and so forth. I want to thank Dr. Leonard Rivetta for serving on the advisory committee. Um, he had no choice. I signed him up and told him, I told him, oh yeah, Leonard will be glad to do it. And then I called Leonard, hey Leonard, guess what? So, but no, seriously, he, he does a fine job of, of, of representing the college and thank you for doing that. So there's some pieces out there. Again, it's gonna shift the way we do things. Um, we're gonna talk about it here a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we're gonna take some deep dives as, as this new bill, HB 8, is now law. It was great to hear the governor say that after he signed and passed out all the pens and everything. It was a wonderful event. And thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, this opportunity and again for jumping in with us and spending that time to develop that historic piece of legislation. Okay, so this is actually gonna be a presentation be, between myself and Dr. Escamilla. Um, recap, here's where it started, January 10th, Sunny Die was May 29th at 6 p.m., that's important. Um, we had a uh, deadline to sign or veto bills this June 10th, eight over 8,000 bills were filed. That's, the, that's more bills than have ever been filed in any regular session. And currently we have uh, 1,246 bills that have been passed and only two vetoed. So as soon as the signee die came along, then we have first call session. Three hours later, uh, the governor called the first special session that will be on property it is on property tax relief and border security we currently have 50 bills filed no movement on any bill at this particular point but the what we'd like to do at this point is take a look at the regular session so general appropriations bill that um, is has been sent to the governor uh, on the 6th uh, June 7th. Um, the most important thing about this particular bill for us is that the contingency rider for House Bill 8, which pro was proposed at $650 million, came in at $682,791,408. So they actually appropriated more than the commission had requested. Just as important is the increase in the TEOG funding by 125%. And, and um, Dr. Escamilla will get into a little bit more about what the TEOG and how important that is to our students. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn over to yeah. Dr. Escamilla. Thank you, Mary. So there are three primary legs to, to, the, to, the, to the legislation, and then there are lots of rules, again, that are going to be developed. I'm, I'm not going to read this to you, but um, I am going to just talk uh, theory, um conceptually about what what happened here there are two parts to the to the first uh, leg which is about state funding for outcomes and as such the the whole the whole push for this piece of legislation has really been around modernizing and making more dynamic a uh, the, the the funding model for community colleges and the way they actually did this was really phenomenal because the, the concepts that they paid for pay, paid really close attention to are, are, are bulleted up there for you when you're talking about credentials of value and high demand fields and transfer and you're talking about the dual credit courses you're talking about the relevance they're talking about increasing the relevance of the curriculum of the credentials for our students in other words the state is saying to us that they want the students to attain as quickly as they can credentials that are worth something, that are more relevant, that are gonna be more useful to them, uh, and to, frankly, uh, to the economy. And as such, uh, the things that they considered like they've never done before um, uh, by doing this, um, we're paying more close attention to our uh, economically and educationally disadvantaged and adult learning students. You know, to hear that from the state was an amazing thing. And so when you start looking at outcomes based on relevant credentials from students, from high, high need students, our highest need students, that is an incredible thing to be basing uh, outcomes on. Next slide. The other part of this, um, again, the first part of the, second part of the first leg of the, of the, of the, of the funding of the, of the 
legislation um, really had to do with, with uh, shoring up uh, smaller colleges and providing, uh, shoring up these, these smaller rural colleges and the like. You know, all throughout the legislation, we knew going into this whole thing, and the reason why this was actually proposed at the heels of the last legislative, the 87th legislature, was because we knew statewide that, sta that our smaller colleges had business models that were sending them off a cliff, off a fiscal cliff in a very short period of time. And so uh, as, as, as part of all of this, uh, our instruction and, and operational support for smaller colleges was, was really woven in through to, to our legislation. And that was really, really important. And then the other, the, the final piece, that 1.3, um, what was also thought out ahead of time because of the experience of Senator Larry Taylor and others who'd been through this with the K through 12 system was that it was, what was built in was, um, uh, flexibility for unintended and negative consequences that would be that would come up from this. So they gave the commissioner lots of um, uh, leeway and so forth to to hammer things out uh, post signing die and um, governor's signature. Next slide, please. Affordability was is the second the, the next primary concept uh, as this legislation was pushed through um, to to shore up students and it was we were talking earlier. Uh, Regent Scott and I and, and, and Jeff, we were talking about um, uh, the, the increase in uh, TEOG, the Texas Educational Operational Grant, that there has been a 125% increase in those dollars. That is a significant amount of dollars that's going to go and shore up, again, some of our highest needs students. And currently, I got some data, some hot off the data that I'm going to infuse into this comment, these comments here, but Ms. Patricia tells me Vice President Patricia tells me that currently we are serving, uh, we are actually awarding about 350 students and with the infusion of, and that's about 28%. So if you, if you look at it, it, the state is increasing 125% of that funding. If you can just do some basic math, you can see our numbers of, of our potential awardees are going to increase significantly. So the affordability through TEOG is a big one. Pro, uh, providing financial aid uh, for students uh, who qualify uh, for dual credit courses will be profound. Students who qualify are, are designated as um, Title I students, free and reduced lunch students in high school, will have no financial burden to have access to these classes, okay? And so as such, um, these are going to be uh, important, important uh, features and, and will have profound implications as the state are now, will now be supporting us like never before. Uh, heads up, Delmar College family, regents and team, uh, we need to review our model and see what really is the best way to uh, go forth into the future and so forth as it relates to uh, providing dual credit for our students. And then finally, up this piece of the affordability, uh, internships, practicums, and the like are critically important to our businesses, as we all know out there. And there will be a nice little bucket of money out there for, for competitive grants for, for, for colleges and businesses to get together to uh, support um, work-based learning opportunities. Next slide, please. And again, as, as, as I said, as uh, the, what, what's, what's really critically important um, as uh, with this legislation was, was shoring up our, what we call our, our brothers and sisters out there with the, at the smaller colleges that have um, smaller tax bases and, and are, um, are, are situated in, in, in critical yet very complex areas of the state. Of the state. Uh, when you're out there in those small rural areas, things are different. And so uh, investment in college capacity was the other thir third primary leg of the, of the legislation that really supports uh, these students, by, uh, these uh, colleges by way of seed grants um, and encouraging shared services. So people will be calling Del Mar College, heads up, they're already calling to partner up and the like. And, and so forth. And then the other thing too that, that really was uh, advanced and, and woven through all this was how the legislation would be supporting and would be, um, would, would see both uh, non-credit and what we call a continuing education slash non-credit and credit uh, education equally. Uh, and they would be looking for um, the 
multiple uses of the curriculum through convertible and stackable opportunities. In other words, if you took a, a non-credit class here that could be used ultimately one day to stack up, convert and stack up towards a, a credential and the like uh, for students. And so investment in college capacity is the big term uh, that was used uh, all throughout the development of this legislation. We'll, we'll get to some finer points here in a little bit. Next slide, please. So some empowering legislation, uh, again, as was mentioned um, this past week, uh, was the signing of, uh, by Governor Abbott, uh, as, as Chair Scott uh, has mentioned. Um, there, the, the, there are some primary components, again, to, to, to this legislation. Uh, the three big pieces of, of, the, of how the pie is going to be divided up uh, from our appropriations will be through performance tier funding. Um, again, I'm not going to read them to you, but, but again, they're, they're, they're critical points that, that will be uh, measured by way of credentials, amount of learning, basically um, the amount of learning that's taking place on the outcome side. And we'll have this presentation for anybody who wants it, by the way. I see some of you taking notes out there. But uh, base tier funding, again, that base tier funding, again, is, 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 is the nomenclature that will be used to, to make sure that, that, the, that the schools, that the smaller colleges especially, don't go out of business, so to speak, and, and are shored up with, with, with the funds that they, that they so uh, desperately need. Uh, student weighted metrics and so forth, again, recognizing the different uh, costs that it takes for students to be brought, you know, through the process as those coming from with, with disadvantaged backgrounds and the like, and so forth. But again, we're we're, we're highly um, infused, are thought of, uh, considered as this legislation developed. Next slide, please. All right. Um, this. Oops, wait a minute. So, How about that one? Did we skip one? Oh, there we go. Go 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 go. go. No, back to it. That's it. Okay, that's me. Yeah. Yep, got you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right, so thank you. Uh, again, um, there are some other, other pieces uh, that came of this. Again, they're, they're, th th this is all the flexibility that was built in. Uh, they've learned not to paint them. So the, the legislature has learned not to paint the state into a corner uh, by being so rigid, but they've, but they provided some extra resources to, to give some flexibility for some other peripheral uh, supports um, for uh, other associated agencies and so forth to be tied in. Um, th there's just a few examples with with the, 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 the dual credit and the TEOG, General Appropriations Bill. It, it, I've, I've already, I'm, I'll be repeating myself if I tell you what happened, but ba w w if I read this again, but I'm, I'm here to tell you that, that the legislation, again, provided the key flexibilities that were, that were so necessary for us to implement this. Mary, you're up. Nope, still you. Oh. <laughs> so, in terms of, Mary, I had this one as yours. Oh, okay. well, I can take it. Yeah, thank um, you. It, do <laughs> it does establish Texas Direct, and that's that associate program that, um, that we're looking at for uh, community colleges and making sure that all of those programs are, are go through and transfer out. Uh, the Opportunity High School Diploma, that's where students in our um, programs, particularly our technical workforce programs, can actually, if they come in and they're getting their technical workforce programs, but they do not have their high school diploma, we can work and get approval to provide them with that high school diploma, which is a great piece. Now, the next steps are exactly what Dr. Escamilla mentioned, and that is the rulemaking. We have until mid-July to release emergency rules on uh, allocations and how we define things uh, that will allow us to do some formula runs. Um, those rules will be adopted, as Chairman Scott said, in August, and they will run August through January, which means immediately in August, we start working on more permanent rules. So it, there's a lot of work to be done. Mary, could you go back sure. two slides? I want to point out that one. The matching, the opportunity to match, use the Pell Grant um, awards as a match for TEOG is going to be huge for our students. That has not been allowed by state law for community college students in the past, and so, th but there does have to be a local match for those TEOG funds. So that's going to be a huge deal for our students who are Pell eligible, of which 
Patricia, there's a huge number. 70, 80% of our students are Pell eligible. Is that close? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And so that's going to be a, a huge opportunity for our students to use that Pell mm -hmm. grant as their match for TEOG. That's right. I just wanted to point that out. That's, yeah, that's that was not one. originally a, a part of our uh, uh, recommendations, but was one of those uh, add ons through the TAC and CAT legislative process that we were able to add to the legislation. Yeah, it's critical. It's, it's absolutely critical that, and, and so our efforts, um, and when I was talking to the, when I was saying earlier team that we have to make some adjustments and stuff, this is gonna be a critical piece right here for our, for our students to have access to those dollars. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I had a question. So, and, and so instead of using the TEOG funds, they'll first access the Pell Grant and then if there's if they still need more funding, then they can access the TEOG funds. Did I say that right or wrong? Or, or they can access both funds at once. The difference in this particular component of the bill is that the, when they get the Pell, before you would they go for the Pell and they go for the TEOG. They could get both of them. They're not exclusive of one another. But before you couldn't use the Pell money for the required TEOG match. We had to find institutional money or the money had to come from scholarships from the foundation. So now we're gonna be able to say, okay, gear up, you can get both. This can it provide the match so you don't have to find additional funding. What it's gonna allow is that um, the foundation is going to be able to continue to provide scholarships, but maybe most of the tuition and fees might be paid by Pell and TEOG, and so the support for students going through college, which is crucial. I don't know if y'all realize this, but for one child for one month in daycare is $755 for one child. That's the average on the state of Texas. You want to get a one-bedroom apartment, you're going to $1,000 to $1,200 these days. And that these are old numbers. But those are the things that create the challenges that our students do not have the financial ability to hurdle those particular challenges. So the match on the, the, the Pell T, TEOG combined and then the opportunity for the for the financial scholarships from the foundation to shore up the um, the educational platform to make sure the students can complete. And that's really what we're all about, is getting them completed. Thank you. You're welcome. So we did have other priorities. Obviously, the community college finance reform was the first one. That was House Bill 8. Um, but the TEOG, um, which was a bill, but it became part of House Bill 8, and that's the piece that we just talked about. Um, we also had cyber and IT modernization, and one of those was House Bill 584, which was passed and sent to the governor. And that one creates a um, kind of a, a truncated um, IT credential that allows the state to hire students who get an associate's in IT instead of a bachelor's because they have such a critical shortage in those individuals who can, who can support the state in their IT initiatives. The clinical nursing site did not pass, and this was a, a pretty important bill to make sure that um, for-profit or and or out of state institutions don't come in and gobble up our clinical sites, but it did not pass. Uh, and then the Texas transfer framework did pass and it has been signed by the governor. Other priority bills, uh, the Texas Early First High School, uh, which is effective nine, uh, the 1st of, of September, the Adult Innovation uh, Career Grant, it didn't pass, but it was added to House Bill 8. Um, Opportunity High School Diploma Pilot Plant, that sent to the governor. Um, it was also added. Some of them were not only passed, but also added to House Bill 8. We were going to make sure that these, <laughs> these pieces got in there. TEA Info, which is one thing that Dr. Eskimi already talked about, and that's, um, it was added to uh, House Bill 8, but it also is its own bill that, that did get passed and sent to the governor. And it's creating that, that warehouse of information where students can find out what, what, 
what programs and what uh, careers pay the most and where can they get those? And by the way, what does it cost to get that through a four-year institution or a community college? I'm sorry, did you need no, to say something? No, I was just gonna say, uh, Mary has put together a, a, a very comprehensive and fine list of, of, of detail behind all of these pieces of legislation. And should you all want that, we can send it out to you all. She just is, I think she's still editing and doing mm -hmm. some things, putting some finer points on it, but we can get the supporting evidence, uh, uh, documentation and links and so forth to this. And so we'll do that. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, the Lone Star Workforce, which is a, a great fund that we'll now have access to. But there are two bills, I think, that are going to be interest uh, to our c campus community and also to you as trustees because you will get questions about them. And I'm going to let Dr. Escamilla deal with those because he'll be dealing with the questions. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mary, so there are both Senate bills 817 and 18. 17 uh, is about DEI and the new language that is law. Um, this has been part of our uh, agenda. This has been part of the state's agenda and, and broadly across the nation if you, if you want to track it that way and has been, um, has been a, a hot topic for a long time. Now, uh, there are, there's language um, that prohibits uh, certain practices with, uh, with, with regards to DEI, and it has been written into law. And so as such, we will uh, take this, um, this uh, legislation, uh, this law, and, and, and understand it and, and implement uh, it as, as required. Uh, General Counsel and I and others have been working on this for some time. And uh, just know that um, it is um, there. There are now restrictions, uh, prohibitions, literally, that are in place. And um, stay tuned as we are unpacking this, as it was just most recently signed in uh, to law. That uh, we are we are trying to understand it and making sure that uh, we are one following the law, and then two still providing and providing. Um, all the services necessary to, to run our college, both for employee standpoint and uh, our students' experience here uh, at the college. Um, there's a couple of slides. You can go to the next slide. There's, there's, there's all kinds of detail here that I've put up there for that, 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 that elaborate on, on the prohibitions and the, the restrictions uh, from Senate Bill 17. And um, we are... I and the team, the team and I are really working to understand it completely. We will be working with our associations. Um, the annual meeting is coming up next month. You can bet we're going to be unpacking it there as well with, the, with our colleagues from the other colleges across the state and so forth. And so stay tuned. Uh, we'll, we'll be bringing this back to you. So DEI now means something um, very different to the state of Texas and we will be in compliance and we will also uh, be bringing it back to you all for for your information. Okay, so next slide. So Senate Bill 18, uh, as it relates to tenure. This is one that we've been watching very closely, um, and this has been signed into to law. And I, I'm, I'm glad, this one doesn't, well, we were hoping tenure wouldn't be addressed or anything this last session, but as it was, it was, it was brought in and, and really, uh, really pertained, I'm going to say, to to it was really focused at other colleges and maybe and it, certainly say universities and colleges, probably in that order, um, that were that probably had some issues with their uh, tenure. I'm I'm proud to say that tenure has been a part of the way we've been doing, um, uh, the way we've been uh, administering and teaching and learning here uh, at Del Mar College for a long time. I remember the day I interviewed for this job back in 2008, and I remember the question asked. They said, "What do you? How do you feel about tenure?" I said, "Well, where I was, there was no tenure but at the current at the current place at the time." And I said, "So, but at, at Del Mar College, if that's the way that we do things. Then, if I am chosen, I will support tenure." And we did. And we it's been a long road, and we have fortified it, and we have we have held ourselves accountable with tenure. And, and, and Dr. Janda lives this every day and watches it and makes sure that 
that tenure here at Del Mar College is not only, uh, well, it, that it's advanced, that it's preserved, that it's protected, that it is monitored, that it is taken very seriously. In a nutshell, I'll just say that the details, you, you could be, you, you could be very you should be very proud, and if, I think we're going to have to open this up for future discussion and, and a future agenda item. But know that we have a very strong system here at the college, a very effective system. It includes post-tenure review and the like. And um, I want you all to understand it, first and foremost. Um, the only thing that I think are the biggest thing, the single biggest thing that this legislation requires is that I now come to you all as a board to uh, seek ultimate approval for uh, tenure of, 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 of our faculty here upon my recommendation. That's the only thing that's really going to, that's the biggest thing that's going to change. I think there's some probably some new, further nuances um, that we're going to have to watch. But that in itself is the, is the biggest, I'm going to call it the linchpin to this piece of legislation. Am I missing something, Augie? Am I, am I okay. So anyway, stay tuned uh, again. But to and and to all the faculty, uh, as we move ahead, we will continue with tenure. The college should continue with tenure. It, it would it has done a remarkable job, and and I want you all to understand again all the work that goes into that, and of which there is much. So stay tuned. That. Okay. That. Mark, I have a um, question. Can can I ask a question? Please, Samantha. So was there a a discussion on politicization of uh, the tenure process. So, As a, you know, we'll, we're seeing that in Florida uh, and we're seeing that in uh, some other states, but so just yes. wondering if, if there was any conscious attempt I, or... The, the, our sister organization, uh, the, what we call the Teachers Association, uh, or Association of, of Community College Teachers and so forth, uh, really um, um, discussed that more in depth and so forth. And we, yeah, we knew what this was going to do, uh, or potentially uh, had the potential to do. What I would also say is the version that came out ultimately was not near as restrictive. I think that's a nice word. Mm -hmm. as restrictive uh, as, as what was originally intended. Again, it, the, the biggest implication for us is that I now, instead of conferring tenure as part of my role, now have to come to the Board of Regents. And so, yes, the politicization uh, the potential of that um, is out there that was discussed. And um, as a publicly elected board that now is, is required by law to uh, approve these things, um, it can be a slippery slope, but I'm sure this board will be just fine. <laughs> but right. uh, so anyway, uh, m m more to come on that. Again, we're one of the fewer, uh, the minority of the community colleges in Texas that still maintain tenure. Again, it, it, it's a solid way of doing business. If you do, it's like anything else. If you do it right, you, you take you do you, you you take it seriously, like we do at Del Mar College, and it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Uh, Dr. Escamilla, or yes. perhaps Mr. Rivera, what are the um, time frame for adoption of the policies? I know that the law goes into effect September 1st, but by when does the board have to adopt these policies? Do you know? It says on or before September 1 of each year. Okay, so, so obviously by September 1 of 24, we, do we have to adopt the policies by September 1 of 23? I don't believe so. It goes okay. into effect. It goes, it goes into effect, it goes into on, effect yeah. on, on the 23. So, so we would have a, we would have academic year to adopt them by September 1 of 24. Correct. Okay. So we yeah, we have to have a little time. So you all will we mm -hmm. let's have a discussion on what that process is going to be. I realize that there's a whole lot of policy development that goes yeah. into place prior to bringing it to the board, but I think it might be good at a future point in time for you just to outline what that process is going to be, since this is a topic that the board has not previously discussed in detail. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Understood. We do have some other relevant bills. Um, they're in your packet. There's not a lot of information on any one of these, and, I, and quite frankly, I don't have a lot of depth on these, um, but I wanted to bring them to your attention. They do affect uh, Del Mar College. 
Um, and if you need more information, I can do some additional research on them. The active shooter training for peace officers, we already do that. Um, the campus safety button, that's really for public schools, but we have two public, we have one public school on our campus, therefore it Im impacts us. Uh, the adult dropout recovery education program, fabulous bill that makes sure that we, we're not losing people. Uh, and then we have the fresh start admission. Um, protect three different bills protecting parenting students, either pregnant or parenting students. So um, some interesting components there, and we will have to designate a liaison officer to assist with parenting students, which we have quite a few. So that's a, a great piece for us. Task force for consolidation of workforce, although it doesn't directly affect us, it does because we utilize these services. Um, and then the T, uh, the the co-board approval on programs for incarcerated students at this point doesn't affect us, but at some point, if in fact that's a, a, an area that we entered, I, we needed to know that. Um, law enforcement accreditation and grants, we just needed to know that. EpiPen injector, respiratory distress, the, just a whole series of different things that we had to be cognizant of. Um, and then we had a bunch of bills for the Texas State Technical College. Um, most didn't pass, but two did. And one expanded into Guadalupe, the other expanded into multiple counties. The one that we were watching, which was the ability for uh, TSTC to provide programs within a community college service area without notice or prior approval, that one did not pass. Um, we have these bills that you had been seeing um, that did not pass. So I just wanted to give you a listing. And at this point, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Any other questions? Yes. You'll Can be you, seeing additional mm -hmm. topics uh, at our state association meetings and different webinars and seminar in, in September, right. et cetera. Dr. Right. Turner. Do you know um, if there's been any, if you heard anything about the bills that did not pass, that they're going to be refiled? I have not heard that yet. The, the special sessions at this point mm -hmm. are very focused and targeted. Mm -hmm. So if they didn't pass, um, you would have to wait for a special session mm -hmm. where the topic was uh, um, associated with those particular bills. So I haven't heard anything right now. It's strictly border That's security fine. and um, um, property taxes. Yeah, I heard that they're going to have another special session in September, and that's going to some of the edu public school education bills are going to be filed then. So I was just wondering. I, I would venture a guess we'll have more than one. Regent Loeb. I, I just wanted to say on the on the tenure, um, I, since we're going to have to come back to it and do a bill review and things like that, but I, I just wanted to say. I am happy with the present management system and how we do that. So if it is you know, an issue where in order to comply with the law, the current process stands and at the end we do a mass vote to approve the decision making from the actual management staff who manages everyone day to day, uh, that's great. But uh, I have no interest in reinventing the wheel or going through professor resumes. Uh, that's not what I signed up for when I signed up for this job. It, 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 it'll, it'll look like an it'll it'll look like an annual report to the board. Um, we'll bring it forth and say, here's the list. This is what I'm guessing. Uh, we'll have final approval from general counsel and our chief academic officer. But there will be a list. Say so these people. As I get it, I get the packet. I confer and everything else. I'll bring it to you and say I rec I, I hereby recommend this. The board considers it. It's a vote, and then we'll move on. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, and I just wanted to say that because I'm. I mean, I, I haven't heard anybody here say anything different, but I just want to say it out loud because I want to make sure that the folks who work for us hear it from some. Of, you know, before we do an official policy, they're not thinking, "Am I? Am you know? Do I have a future here or not?" And so uh, that's why I wanted to say that. And then on the um, on the DEI thing, you know, when we had uh, Dr. Ponjon, when he said belongingness, wellness, and success, uh, I actually thought that that kind of sounded better um, and was more what I, what when we talk about it, um, I think we all mean. And so uh, I just wanted to put that out there as a possibility on, on you know, I, I, I think DEI, whether, however you feel about it, it's kind of become a loaded term at this point. Yes. Uh, 
And I think getting back to talking about what we're really talking about uh, would be helpful. So, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Regent Garza. Oh. Just, just a couple of comments, and they might be just my not being educated along far enough to, I, I've kind of felt that some of the language that I was looking at related to DEI was looking to make us more restrictive in the efforts that we were trying to make. And at the end of the day, we're just trying to do what's best for our students and trying to make sure that everybody has the same opportunities going forward. And so, that, and again, I, I know that legislators are listening to other people and listening to the political connotations of what that actually involves or represents. But uh, I'm just concerned that some of the stuff that we're asked not to do and we're allowed to do is going to be a bit restrictive. That's just a general comment. I'm appreciative of all the state funding and uh, the amount of money that they're going to be giving community colleges and allow us to be able to, to, to do our mission in a, in a better way, in a more comprehensive way. But I just, and then the other, the other thing that I have a little concern about is there was some areas where they talked about us trying to, let's say, try to improve some of the outcomes and had to do with, um, I guess, some of the law enforcement stuff, the uh, cybersecurity areas, trying to train train up some folks. I mean, those may be great opportunities for us to, to help students and get certified and, and be able to, to assist in, in shortfalls in the workplace in those areas, but are there some items that they passed that could create, I'm going to say, for, for lack of a better term, unfunded, unfunded mandates that might require us to do certain things that might not be beneficial for our community, our locale, our, our, our uh, market demands, and, and that, that type of thing. Is there anything there that you're concerned about, Dr. Scamilla? If unfunded mandates, I think if there was a session where unfunded mandates that were directed, uh, however, uh, indirectly, to community colleges, I think this was the least, the least that I've ever seen because of the flexibilities that were built in from HBA and all of the unintended consequences and so forth, they actually addressed those uh, that way. So I don't know of any, uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if you, if you saw any, it, that's usually been um, much more pronounced in past sessions. So I don't, if there's something there, I'll come back to you when, I, when, I, when it pops up, but I don't see any so far. Um, again, we're still, unpacking a lot of this legislation, of which there's much. And again, there's a much more exhaustive list that Mary's put together that we are, that I'm still pouring over. She just gave to me last night, or yesterday. So uh, stay tuned, I'll let you know. But it, so far, lock on. I right. haven't seen anything massive, yeah. um, but there's a lot of bills. I mean, there's 1,200 bills that are passed, and I'm assuming there's probably about 100 relevant to community colleges directly tangentially there's probably more so i we don't have the full answer but i didn't see anything that was um grossly um onerous for community colleges as an unfunded mandate at this point In, initially when you go into doing some of the work that you all did over the last couple of years and the commission did you're looking for additional funding to help us expand and help us do some of the stuff that we were already doing better or more comprehensively, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, if some things that were passed that might require us to do certain things that are not going to give us the number, say for instance, the number of enrollment or the same, have the same impact in the community and in the, in the industrial sector that we've previously had, then that's the concern that I'm talking about is just weighing the benefits we're going to get against what what well, one might be in there that we're hoping is not going to cost us. Okay. The, the beauty of um, an experienced team like we have at Del Mar College is so not only will we as regents, you know, hear the high level results of the session and, and have multiple opportunities for that, but 
Mr. Rivera will be in with his other college attorneys. Uh, TASB, <clears throat> who provides a lot of policy support for community colleges, will be, uh, Tammy will be looking at all those t TASB policies and seeing what impacts us. You know, every, every facet of our operations, those state associations are all looking at the results of legislation. So all of that will be feeding in to Tammy and, and or Dr. Escamilla through Tammy and Augie and others uh, so that if policies or procedures need to change, all that gets fed in over the next several months to our teams and, and they bring to us what we need to, to establish. So I think we'll, we'll, be, we'll continue to hear some implementation kinds of reports. You can anticipate some point this fall, Tammy will come back and say, here's a set of required changes in policies by state statute. And while we were looking at it, we wanted to update these couple of other things as well. So we'll, we'll see that coming back to us uh, in, in a pretty comprehensive form. So anything else on the legislative update? Okay, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, we did that first so that we could have some of that financial discussion out of the way and, and the, the dollars amount, do, the dollar amounts are still not completely clear to us. But as Raul comes up and wants to start go, do our, our next iteration in our budget planning for fiscal year 2024, we thought it would be helpful to have some of that legislative context out of the way uh, because his crystal ball is no clearer than Mary's is at this point to know exactly what the dollars are going to be. But we're beginning to make some assumptions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Mr. Garcia and ask for Dr. Escamilla to punch in whenever he needs to. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, hopefully your punches will come in soft, uh, Dr. Escamilla. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to begin with uh, some of the uh, some of my spiel. Uh, will echo pretty much what has already been said by our chair, Dr. Escamilla, and Miss Mary McQueen. Uh, with this, with that said, uh, for over about a year, there has been a lot of energy placed by the Texas Commission on Community College Finance with transforming the funding formula for Texas public community colleges. Thanks to the hard work of our chair, our president, and members of the commission, their recommendations uh, built into the HB8 legislation has been approved by the governor on Friday. There's now a handoff to the coordinating board and various committees who are now working feverishly on the rulemaking process that includes a new funding formula model. The new funding um, modeling is significantly dependent on measurable performance outcomes uh, uh, by the colleges. This includes the number of student completion and credentials of value, student completion in high demand fields, student success transfers to four-year institution, and course completion by dual credit students. Based on yesterday's tech meeting, contact hours will continue to be a factor in the formula funding model, but to a small degree, uh, to, to a small degree. Uh, in addition, it is my understanding that the contact hour uh, production as a factor to the funding formula model will mainly benefit small to mid-sized community colleges. In addition, there are many funding tranches built into HBA, two of which uh, are a new funding formula model and the financial aid to SWIFT transfer programs for qualifying dual credit students. In May, the coordinating board provided a first financial run of the new funding uh, formula uh, model. Uh, the results of that report uh, uh, is now included in our state appropriations that we will, state appropriations revenue that we will shortly cover. Uh, and then I will also add uh, the coordinating board will soon uh, deliver a revised funding formula uh, model uh, run that will determine our final state appropriations for the 2024. A communication from the coordinating board was issued to all Texas public communications requesting an updated uh, information on the most current student performance data data points. We hope to get the results in the next 30 to 60 days. With respect to the financial aid for the SWIFT transfer programs, uh, we will know more about our share of this funding as the rulemaking process and financial modeling by the commission and committees runs its course. With that said, today's presentation does not include the new funding formula for this tranche. 
So today's slide deck includes new information relative to last year's, uh, last month's board meeting. We have added a history of property tax rates, a listing of strategic plans and initiatives that are driving the preliminary budget plan and employees compensation scenarios for your consideration. We are asking that you please provide your perspective to today's preliminary budget information as we go into uh, the top of the ninth inning with July's budget workshop. So let's get started on some of the critical dates on the next slide. Okay. We are currently at the review and recommendation phase of the budget planning process, whereby estimated operating financial revenue, financial resources, have been allocated to various expense categories that is subject to change for reasons that I just described. Our next uh, round of numbers will occur at the budget workshop schedule for July 25th, where we hope to build a consensus on the 2024 fiscal year budget plan. We will then pivot to the legislative requirement budget approval process that begins with our August 8th board meeting. On this day, the college will propose action items to conduct a public hearing on the proposed college budget and tax rates. Our goal is to complete the budget planning process at our August 22nd meeting, board meeting. On this day, we will conduct our public hearing followed by board action items to adopt the M&O and, and debt service budgets the M&O and debt service tax rates, and the proposed tax exemptions. If there are no questions. Mr. John Johnson will lead us into the discussion on college revenues. Let me just say before I get started, I'm so glad that everybody's completely clear on how, how funding on House Bill 8 will be done. Um, anyway, before I get into the specific items, let me first begin by indicating our preliminary revenue projections are based upon assumptions which in some cases have many unknowns. One, a delay on how allocations of additional state appropriations will be calculated and distributed under House Bill 8. And two, an unprint, unprecedented increase in preliminary, nu preliminary number for the net taxable values received from the appraisal district largely due to a change in how major industries were valued. Historically, in increases have been between two and seven percent. This year's increase was in, eight, in excess of 31 percent. So let's go to the specific items. The board approved a two dollar increase in tuition for the upcoming fiscal year. This increase is expected to add approximately 65,000, assuming flat enrollment growth. Two, budgeted tuition has been adjusted to reflect amounts received in the prior year. Um, note, academic tuition is estimated to be approximately two million below that budgeted in year 23 due to a delay in student returning post COVID. Now going on to property taxes. Our overall strategy was one, to keep the same overall tax rate unchanged. In order to do this and receive the, the additional funding budgeted, we estimated the next net taxable value growth would need to be at least 4.3% and have at least 300 million in new construction. Going on to state appropriations, while the final method on how funds will be calculated under House Bill 8, there, there is some preliminary indication the college will receive at least $2 million in additional um, guaranteed funding per year during the biennium. Are there any specific questions on, on this? Just, just to comment, go ahead, Ben. I was going to say, I think there's going to be some discussion, but maybe not any questions right now, but I think there will be some discussion. Okay. <laughs> John, before you go on, I'd, I'd yeah. just like to report that a couple a comment and a report. The, the two million, we, we are we are we are being cautiously optimistic about things right now. Very very conservative and very cautiously optimistic about what is going to come in from the state. We can't we can't count those chicks those chickens just yet. The other part is 
as the enrollment reports are coming in, we're, we're watching uh, some trends come in that we haven't seen in a long time. And that is that as we're looking towards the fall uh, enrollment, uh, comparing fall to, to previous falls, we are now tracking on par with 2020. It's early yet, knock on wood, it's only June and we get all that. But those are the kinds of indicators that we watch as we prepare uh, for our ultimate uh, budget recommendations in late July. The fact that we are trending equally at this point with the fall of 20 at this point, time, you know, same time of the year, 2020 to 2023, is um, an indicator that we cannot ignore. I'm not saying, I'm not counting my chickens, I'm just saying everybody, that this is a, this is really, really great news and thank you to, to Patricia and Gracie for all the, and all the hard work with the admissions teams over there for, for watching that very closely for us. Thank you, John. All right. So using the uh, challenges and assumptions I just discussed, we are, if you look at the screen, um, indicating there'll be a $2 million increase in our state appropriations, a slight increase in the retirement contribution due to salary adjustments, uh, tuition adjusted downward by $2 million without using the $2 tuition increase due to the immaterial nature of that amount, and a $4 million, a $4 million increase in property taxes. This preliminary is estimated to provide an additional $4.095 million increase in, addi in additional budgeted revenue. Are there any questions at this time? I do. Yes, I do too. Okay, I'm trying to reconcile um, what I just heard. We're anticipating a $2 million drop in tuition, but at the same time we're Indicate where indications are that we're going to have more students than we have in the past. Had that's, in the past. That's why I brought that up. So, so what the, the numbers that John is using um, is is based on uh, trends based on prior enrollments. And if you're comparing scenario, you're creating scenarios based on based on past enrollments. That's that's a number that we have to put on there. So you, we're, we're showing basically the parameter or the the. Mm, the, the, the scenarios, potential scenarios out there, most conservative to to what is now trending. So, John, I don't even know if John has those numbers right now as we're watching uh, summer enrollment come up. So, so the, the 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 scenarios that he's giving are the most conservative right now. Stay tuned. We have to have some things develop. We're we're not we're not we're not putting that in stone or anything at this point. And this, do, this does not include the $2 an hour increase in the tuition. Well, we don't know. Go ahead, John. Well, I mean, the $2 increase in tuition based on the, the amount of tuition we collected last year, if you, if you correlate that to what I'm anticipating for the new year, if we're keeping flat enrollment with a $2 increase, that's only going to net you about $65,000 in new tax, in new tuition revenue. And that's after backing out your 6% um, uh, Texas Public Ed edu Education Grant funds and deducting another 22% for discounted and, uh, tuition and exemptions. So you're really netting about 70% of that $2. So, so again, we're baseline, we're giving, a, I don't want to say the worst case scenario, but we're giving the most conservative perspective because things can get worse, right? So we're giving you the most conservative perspective right now, and that's what we do every year this time. It doesn't sound good. It's not fun. It doesn't. It doesn't. We don't get to. Sorry, we don't get to look forward and 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 just yet with excitement. We have to let things develop. It's so early, you know, to predict next year. I mean, even though we started fall enrollment in April, the numbers extremely fluctuate between now and between now and August uh, of when they start. So I hate to project a big increase until, uh -huh. unless I see it initially. Yep, yep, and, and he's, and so, so he is coming, John is coming to you with numbers that he has had prior to the beginning of summer. And so um, we, we just have to, we, we always start off this way every year. And, and today's, today's conversation about the budget is not putting anything in stone. It's just putting some, starting to throw some things against the wall to see, to see what, what, what's gonna stick because a lot of these numbers are not gonna stick. 
here over the next few I'd weeks. rather come to you, at, you know, in November, December and say we had a surplus in our, in our fall tuition of, of a million dollars, then come back and say, oh, by the way, we budgeted for that extra and we didn't see it. So then we can make, a, make adjustments at that time. Yeah. Um, does that $4 million in property tax increase, is, is, is that going to trigger any kind of rollback? No, I, my, my, um, in other words, when, when we were, I, we had to put together the budget a different, a kind of a different way this year. We said, how much additional revenue do we need to really um, um, do our budget based on the expenditures that we're going to see for the upcoming year? So we needed about $4 million. So what I'm saying is, what does it take to get $4 million based on, on, this, on the values that I'm seeing right, you know, in the prior year? Well, you're going to need to see a 4.3% increase in, a, in the total net appraisal value, taxable appraisal value, with $300 million in, in new tuition to get to that $4 million. Does, do I get back? No, I made sure I didn't get back to that rollback rate because I didn't want to come to you and say, oh, by the way, you can't get those yeah. dollars. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So when, when you were saying that um, we had to see that increase in property values and um, 300 million in additional property, that was to maintain the tax rate, that was not to maintain the tax revenue. You, contemplate, you were contemplating a $4 million increase in was, property tax revenue. It was to get to both scenarios. It was to get it was to be able to keep the same overall tax rate and mm -hmm. it was it was it was done to get four million dollars. What did I have to do to come up with a with an appraisal growth to match the four million dollars? And I felt that at this point in time with the with the growth I'm seeing in, in net appraisal values that four per three four point three percent was very conservative. And what about additional properties being added to the tax rolls? Are you seeing that as well? We haven't seen uh, good figures. I usually use $300 million as my average year after year. Last year, I think we saw 353,000. Um, in the prior year, we saw, I think, nearly 400. But I like to stay conservative because those are just new extra dollars we get that don't impact our rollback rate. Right, all right. Mr. Loeb. Okay, so um, that $4 million is based on $300 million in new value plus right. whatever our maximum rate is for where we don't trigger rollback? Or Correct. Is, okay. Correct. Not the maximum rate. Well, not, not the, the maximum. maximum. Yeah, I'm not right, it's the not the maximum. No, but yeah. I'm getting I'm getting close to that. Okay. That so it's close to that. Right. Okay. So if if the state passes a uh, appraisal increase cap, which they are talking about. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That so that that could be heavily affected by that. Oh, that would be huge. But you know, based on you know, I was I was uh, just at a conference in uh, Fort Worth this weekend of, amongst the community co college officers, and also we had many um, people there from the state. And there was a strong feeling that that's not going to go anywhere, that there was a big difference between what Abbott wanted and, and what the House Speaker wanted and um, that that would never go through. Now, I'm not a politician. I'm just listening to what I'm hearing. So at the last legislative session, when there were caps imposed and, and tightening of, of, of the tax rates and so forth, community colleges were, were excluded very purposely by the leadership of the state. So that coincides with what, what is continuing to happen, mm -hmm. or at least the sentiment that continues from, from, our, uh, from our professional associations. So uh, the, that was a big sign at the last legislative session coming into this one when we were omitted um, from um, those tax gaps and so forth. But still, at four and a quarter is what you're using right now? I'm sorry. 4.3. 4.3 is what 4. you're using 3. right now. Yeah, out of our, and, and the max rate is for everybody's. The well, eight percent. Eight percent hits the rollback rate. Yeah. Is it effectively uh, the rollback rate and everything else, just for everybody's information. Okay, so uh, I've also heard the appraisal district wants a like 13 percent fee increase for their budget. 
I've not, I've not spoken to him. I had two phone calls today that I did not take, so I imagine it had something to do with that. Um, <laughs> so have, I assume that you'll that, have to talk to the people who do the we, we, We're, we're the in budget. conversations with them. We'll uh, the, I, I, my assumption is that gets taken out and it gets counted against our caps or things like that. No. No? no. Is that separate? No, that's a separate fee we pay. Okay. But I mean, we, we have to we have to tax it, and then they take that percentage, whatever, out of everybody's budget. No, no. they 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 charge us a set amount per year based on the appraisal district's budget, right. and based on what the total uh, revenue dollars that we collect, right. or the I'm sorry, the total value um, in comparison to all the other entities that right. are running through the appraisal district. Ours usually runs about 10% of their budget, 9 to 10% yeah. is what we pay. As we divide it up between the other entities. Okay. What, how, how much is their budget? I'm just wondering if it's, I mean, yeah, is well, it? I, yeah, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know. I could probably tell you I mean, more. We pay about 900000 so if you, okay. you know, if you correlate that back to, do they have like if a that's 10, 10%. So they have like a $10 million budget. Right. Okay. So they they want another couple hundred thousand from us, or I'll almost. You know, oh, okay. I'm <laughs> All right. I'm sure Ronnie's watching right now. No, I'm just kidding. So we'll see. Do you have any more questions? No, that's it. The question I have related to the state appropriations that is the uh, performance based funding. That's not any of the potential tuition support <clears throat> no. for our students. So no, that's no. That's just what we you know feel like we should be getting um, based okay. on the initial uh, doll, um, uh, memos we received both in march and then we received again and it's a placeholder right now until it's we just get, a it, place get it holder. i get it yeah Absolutely. i mean until, if we lose it you know we'll be back right um, we, we should know by the coordinating B. board's meeting in august what those temporary rules are so i know we've got some time well i think that they lot, said we were supposed to get better numbers by july 15th is right my they're finishing up their work in july the coordinating board will adopt those temporary rules in august for, right. prior to september 1 but i think what is it, whatever's recommended would be what the coordinating board adopts and so i guess that's right and so by the july meeting we will mm -hmm. still be um dealing with uh, numbers that are not um, absolute at that point. And so we're gonna push this, this budgeting um, development, uh, the budget development uh, into August really to, to, to get some firmer numbers. But I, but I think politically we'll have an idea. Everything, the, the good news has been everything that the legislature has been pushing forth and all the things we've been assured of has been reliable. And we'll give it our best. We'll give it our best iteration. This at is that the point. best information. We yeah, have that's today. it. Uh, then my other question around tuition and fees, and, and I appreciate and I agree with the approach to stay conservative on tuition and fees. Mm -hmm. uh, but the implementation of the scholarship dollars for dual credit, the implementation of the TEOG, and the potential to use Pell grants to match, could potentially garner us some more tuition dollars sure. anything like that shows up as tuition for us even if it's federally funded or state funded it shows up in our tuition number well it depends yeah, well, you may if, explain because the dual credit the way it sounds like right now they call it a grant or scholarship and so it depends on how they model this and let me explain myself right now we charge 33 dollars per credit hour for dual cr credit if they, go, if they do their modeling on a per credit hour basis, and they say the maximum rate, I'm just gonna throw a number out there. Let's just say it's $99. Well, right now our tuition rate is $33, so our tuition is only gonna capture $33. But if it goes up to $99, then we need to possibly have a conversation. Do we now change the dual credit rate, tuition rate, from $33 to $99. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, then yes, it'll come through in our tuition. So it all depends on how the model this, right. and we probably need to have more conversation as to how we capture those dollars into our tu tuition revenue. <laughs> but right now, there's not a lot of information to, to work with. 
I and, certainly understand that. And I yeah. understand that there might be even a, a differentiation between in-district and out-of-district for those rates, et cetera, what, what applies for yeah. state dollars. My, my question on the revenue side is at, at some point, um, we can take the, the easy way, which is just based on historic trends and what we think is going to happen. Yeah. But if we wanted to get uh, sophisticated in, in trying to project what those potential scholarship dollars or grant dollars might do on the tuition side, is that even worth the time this year or do we wait for next year after those rules are fully implemented? So I just want us to be cognizant that some of the work that, that Patricia might be doing and that financial aid might be doing and projecting how those dollars get used might inform this. And I don't want us just to completely ignore that because it is a significant investment of dollars. It is. And sure. So I don't want us to ignore that in our budgeting process. So maybe find out what other colleges are doing and how they're uh, trying to project what revenue might come out of yeah. uh, those scholarship dollars. Yep. It's very it, it, early from the meeting I went to in Fort Worth, that came up in the, in the um, um, comptroller's um, get together. And most people were taking a very kind of a backdoor approach. We're going to wait and see what happens before we include those dollars in our budget. Because it's easier to, at, at the year, if you get the money, then you can say, okay, we're going to either expand programs or buy equipment or do whatever you need to do. But it's harder to back those dollars out. Yeah. And, and one of the other things that's been contemplated by our, uh, our colleagues around the state are budget amendments mid-year amendments and those, in other words, another, another bite at the apple of developing the budget and modifying a budget in mid-year as we, as we learn more. So all of those methodologies we're, we're waiting to see and checking with our colleagues to, to see what is appropriate and we'll, we'll bring, bring that back as a possibility if it, um, if we, if it, yeah. yeah, thanks. I'm sorry, one more point, Mr. President, I'm sorry. Uh, talking to some of the colleagues at our uh, TACPO meeting, there's some institutions that are not even budgeting for the $2 million. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so they're t taking a ultra conservative approach to this. And so uh, we feel comfortable as a college that the $2 million today that we saw from the first run is a reasonable amount. And there are some institutions that are doing that. And so we're, we're just doing the same. Uh, but here's the other thing about the dual credit. There's other conversations, I believe, around the possibility of uh, a component to this initiative for uh, books, supplies, and other ancillary costs for the dual credit. So it's a, it's a bigger analysis. So the question is, do we, do we want to jump on the bandwagon? The answer, to, to analyze it, the answer is yes. Uh, but at the sa same token, we want to uh, make good use of our time and build that analysis on better information. And I'm not too sure we have that today. Yeah. So. Any other questions or comments from board members okay, on one. this section? Real, yes, sir, Mr. Garza. Real quickly, talking about the appraisal. When I do the number, getting from 65 million to 69 million, to me that represents closer to a 7% increase in the property tax side, revenue side. Uh, what I'm hearing from the appraisal office, appraisal district, is that across the board, they're thinking they're going to net somewhere around a 30% increase in, in valuations, which to me would indicate that the property tax rate that we adopt is going to have to be reduced in order to be able to stay within, it, out, out, from, from, I mean, from exposing ourselves it's true. to, to mean, a rollback we rate. We just took a rate that we knew would collect the $4 million. Yeah. I mean, they could go up 300%, you know, in appraised value. But at the end of the day, we can still only get $4 million or, or because the tax rate will just keep dropping until you're only collecting that amount of money. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was trying to bring out I mean, is that we so, may have to look at I mean, you know, at the end the of the day, rate. you may yeah. see a lower tax rate than you're seeing now, but I, I can't predict that. We're being very conservative with our speculative uh, right. pro projections and numbers and so forth. So we, we did talk about that. And anytime we can do that, as you've seen historically that we have, uh, we're proud to do that. But again, too, too early. Yeah, it's, it's too early extremely to early. And like I say, with, with the, the huge increase that they're seeing now, that and, and, and there's a large indication that a lot of that 31% increase, 
you're never going to see the dollars from that 31% increase. You just, it's not going to happen. But we have some more meetings with the appraisal district and the county to kind of go over these numbers just to iron out what's actually going on. Um, anyway, are well, there any the, more questions? Well, it, it, aren't the uh, appeals from the industry still ongoing? Yes. The, the, yes. the really, appeals are still going I mean, on. It, it, that could have some major effects, too, on the taxable values if, sure. if they're successful. Sure. So, Mr. Crow, we have we have meetings that we were just talking about prior to this meeting. We were we were just standing out here and getting ready for. So the the short answer is you're absolutely right, and we absolutely don't know enough right now to talk about it. But we but and we absolutely need to stay tuned. <laughs> but we're we're, we're going to come back to you sooner than you expect. Uh, yeah, perhaps the, the protest, as you said, they they've about quadrupled this year over last year. So. Just you know, over, just overall, just the numbers, not the dollars, just the but number. The, the of number people. of, and that's mostly homestead. Homestead, homestead yeah, but it yeah. almost quadrupled. All right, you have one more slide, and then turn it over to Dr. Yeah, no more. Okay, the last slide just gives you a, a five-year ta uh, tax rate history. Um, as you can see, it's gone from a high of 0 0.2 at 8600 down to 2.66104, which was what we're current, what we currently have, and what we're, what we've uh, proposed for next year. Um, we do show a decrease in our debt service rate of about, I think it's uh, point. Um, I have it here. 0 0.007807, and that's mainly due to a decrease in our debt service obligation for the upcoming year, 1.73 million dollars. Um, when you're looking down at the bottom of that slide, you'll see that the, the um, average cost of a, of a taxable homestead is now $229,500. Last year it was about $206,000, so it's gone up 14%. And so even though you keep the same tax rate, you're increasing your, the tax collections by the same percentage of 14%. So, the actual dollars on, on an average um, taxable homestead over last year is seventy-seven dollars. Thank Are you, sir. Any questions? Any other questions for Mr. Johnson? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Regents and Madam Chair. And now we get to the part of our budget presentation that we always include, and that's to remind us that the purpose of our, um, our annual budget process is resource allocation. And uh, we allocate, want to be sure that we allocate the resources according to the strategic initiatives that support the strategic goals of the college that support the mission. And it looks like, okay, we've got a little bit of a problem here with this slide, but there are two, uh, the way that it's supposed to be, something happened when we sent it to print, but the first um, initiative, oh, thank you, is it goes hand in hand with what's going on right now with the transfer transformation of our state appropriation funding model. And that's to support the Texas community colleges in providing the, the, our students with the education they need to obtain the credentials so that they can get the jobs in the higher demand, high demand workforce jobs that are a part of the Texas economy. And so we, I don't know if it's in your packet where you can see the right slide, but we'll make sure we get that to you. But we, we include that first initiative, and then over to the right, we include the goals and the objectives that are included. Additionally, it is to make sure we have adequate student support services, and that's so that we can support our students in their goals of attaining 
this education that they need, and that is so that they can persist and complete their credentials. And then, of course, every year we have the second initiative, which is to recruit and retain exceptional faculty and staff. And we need quality faculty to provide this education to our students. So that is a very important initiative that we include every year. And then, of course, the qualified staff to support the faculty in their endeavor. And now I will turn it over to Tammy McDonald, who will talk about salaries. Thank you. So I'll give a little bit of a brief, so now we have some new board members. On our faculty nine month salaries, we have, it's made up of four components. Those components are what we call a common base, education, rank, and your experience pay. So those four together make up a nine month contract. So we have some different scenarios that we'll be proposing for faculty exempt and non-exempt employees. In scenario one, it represents approving the one year of experience pay at $829, which is the current rate that's in policy for the experience pay. So that would remain the same, but it would be approving that year of experience pay. And then adding 1% to the pay schedules for common base, education, and rank. So it would be a 1% increase to those schedules. For example, currently the common base for faculty is $53,560. So 1% to that would make it $54,096. So then rank and education each have a schedule depending on what rank you're at or what education component you may have, a master's or a doctorate degree, then that would be 1% to those schedules. So when you take an account for that increase, and then we always have to add the appropriate benefits that are associated with the increases. And then we also added in on our adjunct pay schedule. And it depends on what level of um, education you're at. That's how much you get paid for teaching an adjunct class. We also use the adjunct pay schedule to pay overload to our full-time faculty. So we are proposing a 5% increase to that schedule. That schedule has not had an increase since 2015. So we're proposing the five. So when you add all those together plus the benefits, that'd be a little bit over $1.1 million for that scenario for faculty. Under the exempt scenario one is taking a 1% increase to ex full-time exempt employees. On non-exempt scenario one is a 1% increase to our full-time non-exempt. And then it's a 3% increase to our part-time. And it's a certain category of part-time. We have not in the past uh, provided a budgetary line item for our part-time employees. I'm gonna call them our core group. Um, we have had these conversations in the last few years as part of also our, our college-wide compensation committee. So we thought it was appropriate to start putting something in the budget for our, what I'm gonna call our regular part-time. And so there would be some exclusions. Of course, grant employees are not in this budget. Um, student assistance or work study. They are not, um, work study is paid by federal or state monies. Uh, student assistance, they come and go every semester. Um, instructional part-time employees, they could come and go every semester. We may hire a skills trainer and they teach one week out of the entire semester. So those are excluded from this 3%. It's, it's to that core regular part-time employee. So scenario one includes the salary increases and benefits we just discussed, and that would be a little over 1.5 million. So scenario two has the same components, but what we're doing is on faculty, we're applying a 2% increase, keeping the adjunct schedule increase at five, 2% to exempt, 2% to full-time not exempt, and keeping the 3% for the part-time. So that would be a little over about $2.1 million. Scenario three, again, it would be a 3% on faculty, it would be a 3% for exempt, a 3% for part-time and full-time hourly. And then it would stay with the adjunct at, at 5%. So that would give you the little over 2.7 million. 
So what we did is we added a scenario four, which is a combination of some of the other scenarios. Some of these, this scenario comes out of our work through our college-wide compensation committee. Some of the um, priorities, because we do ask them to give us priorities, so an increase. Of course, you know, all, all, all different employee groups that were represented wanted some type of pay increase, so we have a pay increase. Um, the faculty representatives did want to see the adjunct schedule increase since we had not had an increase in, in close to eight years. Um, it was a consensus from all employee groups that are represented that the hourly employees receive a larger increase than faculty and exempt. So scenario four combines some of those priorities that came through with the compensation committee. So the scenario four is a 1% to the three components of faculty and the 829 year of experience. It's 1% to exempt, 1% to full-time non-exempt, and then it's keeping the adjunct at 5% and the part-time core group at 3%. And then when you add in all the benefits associated with these increases, it'd be $1,755,168. So the reason we're giving you a scenario four, which is a combination, again, some of the priorities from the compensation committee, is because when you go into the details of the budget for all expenses, it's going to reflect the numbers from scenario four. So we did use scenario four to plug into our, our expense budget as we move forward. Do we have any? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there you go. Yes, scenario three would be giving a 3% increase to the three components of faculty and the year experience pay, 3% to exempt, 3% to non-exempt full-time and part-time, and then a 5% increase to adjunct pay schedule. So that would be the highest category, yes, sir. Okay. But for the purpose of moving forward with uh, our expenses for the budget, like I said, we did use scenario four to plug in and you'll see the results of that in just a few minutes. Any questions? I have a question on the uh, on the pay scales. Uh, do they get a yearly <clears throat> increase uh, based on time of service, or how how does the pay scale work? We have multiple pay scales. Faculty have the four components, and the year of experience, in a sense, I guess you could equate it to like an ISD that has like a step increase. That is. Um, but it does still have to be approved through the budget process. It's not a given. As far as the um, pay scales for exempt and non-exempt, and we have various pay scales depending on um, maybe what area you work in. We have pay grades, what we call them, and pay ranges. There is no um, set increase. It's based on what we can do in our budget process for our employees. Okay, so, fa so faculty gets, I, I guess the question is, does this number or the total expense budget reflect our faculty having their step increase? They don't and truly have get, a yeah. And then the 1% is the increase of the steps or is it the same thing? They don't have steps. Okay. Yeah, they don't, they, have, they don't have steps. It's not set up that way. No, sir. Okay. So we're, we're that 1.7 is a 1% increase in faculty other than the adjuncts, right? It's a 1% one one increase in the three components of the common base, rank, and education, because they all have a value attached. If, you, okay. if you're a full professor, that's an additional $12,000 in a nine-month contract. If you're a full professor, that's how much that rank, rank okay. is associated. It's also the um, education piece. Do you have a master's, an MFA? Do you have a doctorate degree? So those have an extra dollar amount attached to them, so they're not steps. You have to attain the education or attain the rank. And then the common base is anyone coming in at faculty rank, they all start at the common base, which is the 53560. Okay. But in le so unless you're, it, unless you get a doctorate, uh, or do something to trigger one of those increases, your only increase that you get is whatever we approve here. Yes, there's, there's nothing that's 
in our policies and the faculty schedules our board policies, the pay schedules, there is no increase for any employees unless it's approved by the board. There's no automatic movement in any, okay. like I said, we don't have a step system. There's no automatic movement. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mm -hmm. McDonald. Uh, so, non-salary operating expenses, our next category for allocating financial resources valued at $1.9 million. In general, non-salary operating expense category includes operating costs relating to property insurance, computer hardware and software, maintenance and repairs, ground maintenance, costs associated with new uh, program development, uh, student support services, and security and safety uh, operational costs. Details of these resources, uh, resource allocation is provided in the next three slides. Okay, so this slide provides a snapshot of our three main operating expense categories, including salary for 2.1 million, non-salary, and contingency. A few minutes ago, Mr. John Johnson described the college's estimated new revenue increase for fiscal year 2024 valued at $4.1 million. Slightly more than 50% of these new dollars is allocated to employee compensation. As you can see here on the screen, it's $2.1 million. The non-salary expense is the second largest resource allocation of new dollars valued 1.9 followed by the remaining resources allocated to contingency that's valued at 61,000, the total right in the bottom in the middle, $4.1 million of new revenue dollars. So uh, on a year over year basis, the 2024 preliminary budget valued at $118.8 million represents a 3.3% 3, 3 increase over the prior year's budget of $114.7 million. One last point, this year-over-year uh, -year increase of 3.3% is low when compared to April's inflation rate of the state of Texas of 4.9%. All right, let's dig into the details. All right. As previously discussed, there's a heightened level of uncertainty with our state appropriation funding levels, so there's a good possibility that our expense allocation that you see before you uh, will change. Uh, nearly half of the 4.1 million of the new revenues allocated to employee compensation uh, of $2.1 million. Um, and this includes Tammy's employee compensation scenario for valued at 1.75 million and part-time compensation valued at 370 for a combined value of 2.1 million. The increased funding in our part-time compensation valued at 370,000 will be used for instructional costs associated with the scaling up of our workforce programs and our culinary programs. In addition, we are anticipating the scaling up of student support uh, library services as we open up uh, our, our, uh, our buildings. Uh, moving on to the non-salary expense categories, the next one, uh, the supply postage copier increase will support general operating costs. Uh, that's uh, $406,141. Next is maintenance and repair. The maintenance and repair increase will help fund deferred maintenance and general operating costs. The technology uh, allocation valued at half a million dollars, that's the last item on, on the screen, will be used uh, in part to scale up internet connectivity and related network and security equipment needs. And it will be used in part to fund a new college-wide computer replacement initiative that will positively impact our students and instructional services. Are there any questions on this line? Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to the next slide. The utilities and telephone increase of uh, uh, 81,000 um, uh, will help fund deferred, I'm sorry, will uh, deferred, 
the, the utility expenses uh, will mainly support the scaling up of operating costs associated with the ramp up of our operations at the Osho Creek campus and our library services as we open up those buildings. As you can see here, the lion's share of the new dollars uh, is going to fund property insurance costs. This elevated allocation of resources is driven in part by our insurance assessment, insurers assessment of the financial risk associated with natural disasters. Total there is 4.1 million. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the contingency is the last expense category on this slide. So in accordance with our cash reserve board policy, the college's operating budget will include a minimum contingency line item reserved equal to 1.5% of the total proposed expenditure budget. Based on our preliminary budget uh, operating expense budget today that you see before you, our contingency will increase from $1.7 million to $1.8 million. There are no questions. Ms. Keyes will lead us into our final slide. I have a question. Um, oh, yes. So uh, when, when is our windstorm renewal date? Here we go. <laughs> May 1st. May 1st. Okay, so we have already... We have already renewed. That's a locked-in number. Yes. Okay. Um, those of us who have an end of year, you know, it kind of jumped up on everybody, um, but uh, we have stacked coverage with Higginbotham, right? Yes, we have different layers of coverage with Higginbotham, yes. Okay. Um, and and one, one thing, on where it says insurance, yes, the majority of it is our property insurance, but that also includes all of our other insurance programs like our general liability, employer's liability, auto insurance, auto liability. It includes workers' compensation insurance and unemployment insurance. So it, there's there's a multitude of other insurances in with that line where it says insurance. But I, I, I'd imagine... Yes. a. Big yes, chunk the bulk of the, is property. Yes, the sir. bulk is property, and the bulk of property is windstorm. Yes. Um, I, I would suggest um, looking at the pool. Um, that has not been the case for the last decade or so, but uh, commercial and institutional folks are going back into, you know, we, we had, TWIA is capped at a 5% increase. And we've had enough 20% increases in the general market to where the general market has now caught TWIA. And so, I mean, I, I, I would also say start looking at the pool. And the first thing on looking at the pool is looking at our construction and making sure that we have windstorm certificates on all the buildings, or at least we don't have any pending stuff um, because I. I think, you know, if it's the same next year, it may be, I, I know on the general commercial side, it is cheaper now to be in the pool than it is to be outside the pool. And that has not been the case for the last decade. I don't, I don't think there's anything we could have done about it like now, because I mean, it's, it really is, I'm, I'm a December 31 renewal. And so what we've all heard is basically what happened to the, to the May renewals was you need to you need to go check all your certificates and let's go back into the pool but that that's my suggestion on that and then it'll be bad but at least it'll be a five percent increase on whatever we can act whatever value we can get into the to the state pool um rather than a 30 percent increase which is normal i mean that's what everybody's seeing but um yeah that's well, we we did go out three years ago we went out for bid yeah and so we do have a five-year contract and then renewals. And of course, our agent could go out to any market that they want to. Right. And we did, at that time three years ago, we did have what we consider our pool is pretty much TASB. And they would not um, bid on our program. They weren't taking on that extra liability for property insurance three years ago. So TASB would be kind of considered our pool. Um, but you know, our agent is, is capable of going out to the entire market and bring us the best value that we can. And, and we, we worked hard to get the best value we could for the 5-1 renewal yeah, I, without stripping totally down the insurance to what we were not comfortable with. Uh, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. You, uh, our agent is my agent. So, um, and so I think uh, <laughs> the, 
there's some right. stuff that we can do that might give us some other options. Right. And but also, not this year. Not this year. Yeah, we're, we're hosed this year. From, from last year's renewal to this year's renewal, we added a whole campus. So the majority of the 1.1 is seeing that full campus being placed on our program. So that's probably at least 800,000 yeah. was the new campus being placed on our, our policy for a full year. So the majority of that is seeing that, that statement of values went up significant when we added on a full campus and content. So that, that's a big portion of that increase also. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm not suggesting changing agents. I'm. Right. I'm suggesting like, let's right. let's look at if we can do some background work and maybe get get the insurers a little more comfortable, or go into Twia's pool to try to, you know, offset in future increases. Right. right. But I just wanted I, to put that in context yeah. too. If we didn't yeah. mention that that we did just add on a full campus. Right. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions on our non-salary expenses as presented? All right, Mr. Garcia. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Thank you very much. Just to tie this back together to what we're looking forward to in anticipation of what may happen this year with additional funding coming out of the new appropriations bill. What you have here are priorities that the college has already set. And they all focus around the opportunity to enhance and grow programs, enhance programs, enhance student services, to support a lot of what you've been hearing over this last summer and the last few board meetings about the focus on student support services and how do we uh, enhance what we're already doing in many ways and growing programs that follow along with the new funding priorities that's coming out of the state. Also, we're going to focus on technology and equipment then that would support those programs. And so all that has been considered. It's all on the table as far as the college administration is concerned. Now then we're just waiting exactly to see how the funding is going to lie out for this next year. So hopefully this will all be good news as we move forward into the next year. And that really completes where we're doing, going with the budget. Mr. Garcia. So that concludes our presentation. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next round will be in July, hopefully with a lot more answers. <laughs> um, we are now going to move on to a discussion of our, an update on our current strategic plan and talk about our process. So this is a, this is a twofer because we're, we're still flying the plane while we're planning on the next model. Dr. Yes. Villarreal. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Scott, Dr. Escamilla, board members. So in the emergence of strategic planning started in higher education around 1930, due to competition from other institutions, enrollment, and the need to adapt to changing times. And so I think we can agree that today in 2023, um, it's still very relevant for us. So Del Mar College operates on a five-year strategic planning cycle, and the goal of the plan is really to create some overarching goals and key performance indicators to guide the college in a more concentrated effort. So we not want Del Mar College to only thrive, I'm sorry, survive, but to thrive. We want to thrive for the benefit of our students, our faculty, our staff, and our community. So the college currently uses the Society for uh, College and University Planning, the SCUP model, to structure the strategic planning process. So components of a proper strategic plan um, are to number one, carry out the institution mission, vision, and values, to comply with federal mandates and accrediting bodies, and number three, to keep the institution operationally and fiscally sound. So the goal of today's presentation is to provide you an update on the college's current strategic plan, and then I will also update you on the plan that is being provided for the future. So in your packet, you received up-to-date information that was provided to um, the board who was here in September. So you received a comprehensive update on these numbers in September of 22 uh, by Dr. Ramirez Wilson. And so for the new board members, what I'd like to do is give you an overview of what's happening um, in the third year of the plan and then talk about the future plan. 
So right now, when we're, you're looking at is you're going to be looking at year three of Inspire, Engage, Achieve, and that's going to be fall of 21 to spring of 22. So I've talked to our IR team, and they have said that by September of this year, we will have data from the coordinating board for year four. So I would like to come back to you if it's appropriate in, September, in October, probably, and give you that update as we move forward. This is the current timeline that you have been looking at for the past three years. We started in 2018, and in 2019, we developed, and you approved the plan. So we started that plan, and we're now in year three and rolling into year four. The new plan, the 2024 to 2029, if you can believe it, is what we are currently planning for. And so as you can see, you're right at the tail end of our current plan as we move forward. So yes, we're, we're continuing with the current plan and planning for the next plan at the same time. So this is the vision and the mission that the Del Mar College Board of Regents adopted. And you read our vision statement every time that we come in. Uh, but we also have the mission statement, which is really our definition of what we are here to do. Right? We're a multi-campus community college. We're here for affordable degrees, certificate work uh, programs, customized workforce. And so this is the vision and mission that we currently work off of. These are the core values that the college adopted a few years ago. One of the challenges in working in our current plan is we, do, uh, we are able to be flexible. And there were some changes made in September that Dr. Wilson discussed with you. Um, however, here we are today looking at our core values that include words such as diversity and inclusion. So we are going to need to be reviewing that as well. So year three, again, fall 2021 and spring of 22. This plan consists of six major goals. Then under each goal, there are going to be several KPIs that we've used as measures. There are strategies and targets that the college works on to move the needle for each goal. So in September of 22, when the plan was updated, we reflected changes such as um, after the COVID-19 pandemic, right? There were some very uh, challenging things that were coming up here in the community college world in higher ed that we really needed to consider. Also, uh, continuing education and corporate services had not taken a, a, a priority in the first plan. And so we really focused on, on shaping that into the second part of the plan. So you can see there's much more robust um, and still things needing to increase to look at our entire student body as we move forward. So again, each goal has established KPIs, but then we also have that operational plan. So what you see is the overarching strategic plan, but we as college staff use that operational plan to really dig down into what we have to do day to day. Are there any questions so far? So the data that you're going to be seeing is data that we have here in-house by our, our team, but also data that we use by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. So you're going to hear things that we talk about, such as our credit students, right? And as, as you saw some of the data that was provided in your packet, and you were looking at the, the data points, you could see that some of it said, all credit students excluding dual credit, or all credit students including dual credit. Uh, first time in college students, what we call FTIC. So just keep in mind as we move forward, each data set really is a different snapshot of what our current student body looks like day to day. So goal one, completion. Completion sounds very simple. Did somebody graduate? Did somebody complete or didn't they? But when you look at the many goals of our community college students and the data for each metric, measuring completion is very complex. So these are the six KPIs, the key performance indicators that goal one, just goal one looks at. All of these are very important indicators to student success. So what we want to do here at the college is, of course, number one, we want our students to succeed, right? Who's graduating? Who's completing? We want to support our students to enroll in full-time classes because the idea is if you're going full-time, you're taking less time, things in, in life aren't creeping up on you, and you can complete your degree and get out there and be successful. 
We also want to capture our dual credit students and try and ensure that if they're staying here in Corpus Christi, we'd like for them to continue at Delmar College. And if you're, if you're in a continuing education program, we want to be able to streamline that program so that if you want to move into from CE to our academic side of the house, that it is streamlined for you. Are we increasing where we need to be and decreasing where we need to be for student completion? At the beginning of the plan, our students were taking a little over five years to complete a degree. We have been able to help students to, grease, to decrease that time. However, um, they are still taking a few classes, but there's still some work that we really need to get done there. Our target is to have students complete in four and a half years and take as little as 83 hours to complete that. Right now, more high school students are earning a degree or a certificate by graduation, so that has also increased, so that is good to hear. Also, our Hispanic students and our economically disadvantaged students are also completing at higher rates. Yes, sir. This is a real picture. This, is, this young man, I don't recall his name, he's from West Osa, he's going yes. to Princeton. Yes. He's a graduate of West, he's wearing his he was also a Butch Day Scholar this year. Was he? Yes, which that supports kid, Delmar that College. That kid had more energy coming off of him. He, he, he just mm -hmm. walked across the stage the other day. So I just have to, just had to add that. Princeton, not bad. <laughs> not bad at all. Goal two, recruitment and persistence. These are the four areas that we looked at in goal two. Goal 2 seeks to improve enrollment and persistence. We want more sophomores, and we want to increase the number of students who receive Pell Grants. So our number of sophomores has increased to a little over 21%, but our target is 25. So even though we're increasing, we definitely want to do better and keep moving forward. This 2021-2022, uh, we had over 4,000 students who were awarded the federal Pell Grant. And again, this is one of those data points that we have to be careful with. I believe when y'all were speaking with Dr. Juan Juan, we talked about the number of Pell Grant students. However, not every student at Del Mar College who's here for a degree or certificate qualifies for Pell Grant. So I know we're still challenged. We definitely want more Pell Grant students out there, but as that you can see, we really are capturing quite a few number of students who are receiving that support. And now we're hoping with the state appropriations, that's definitely going to increase more. That last uh, arrow, increasing enrollment in CE, we've had some really great programs. The True Grant, which y'all have heard about, which considered healthcare, welding, HVAC, bookkeeping in our programming, the construction trades, all of those programs have helped to increase our number from 2,000 students in 2018 to over 4,700 students, and that was in 2020 and 2021. Goal three, academic preparedness and student learning. In this slide, you're starting to see the words developmental coursework. TSI, which is the Texas Success Initiative Assessment, and the Academically Unprepared Student. These are terms that we use a lot here at the college. TSI is that exam. I'm sure you've heard of it out there. Um, most students who are coming into the college have to take it. Dr. Turner is nodding her head. It's going to assess you academically in reading, writing, and math, and their score determines what level they're going to start at here at the college. A couple of data points that we've been really proud of is uh, we've seen an increase in the reading TSI. So students who came in, who they were, con they were termed academically unprepared, were able to pass that reading TSI within two years. Um, we've also seen, again, there's that FTIC, the first time in college student. They came in and were deemed as unprepared to take a math or a reading course, but then they were able to, within a couple of years, due to the student support services, pass those courses, and those are starting to increase slowly. So we're really proud out of that. Now, if you can see our targets there, we're still, our targets are at 20% for math and 30%. So we still have some work to be done, but we know that we're definitely moving things forward. Dr. Turner. Yes, and I noticed um, last year the 
CCISD, even some of the other surrounding high schoolers are now doing a college prep course in math and reading and for seniors and juniors to help prepare them for community colleges and so forth. And one of the things, because my husband taught it last year at King High School, and they're constantly testing and reviewing to increase these scores. So it'll be interesting to see if these numbers change as high schools help prepare those students more for passing those entrance exams tests. That's a great collaboration because right now Del Mar College does do quite a bit to help those students along the way. We have everything from workshops to peer tutoring. We have online tutoring. We have things on campus for students to come to. So again, a lot is being put into this work so that our students are being prepared and able to move forward. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Next was goal four. And that was our learning environments. And here's the first time in the strategic plan that you hear about qualified personnel. So looking, um, and that's what you just looked at within the budget, is having those accomplished and qualified faculty and staff that are facilitating our learning and productivity. So again, for this is for 2021 and 2022. So for this goal four, the strategic plan is looking at compensation rates. Um, we're looking at the Clary Act and also looking at space utilization. Last year, DMC ranked number six in Texas for faculty pay. And also, and I believe you receive information on that. You also, as a board, receive information on the Clary Act. And, um, and we also comply with the Violence Against Women Act, which is a federal, uh, a federal law. I've got some questions. Uh, am I remembering that there are 50, how many um, junior colleges in the state? There's 50. 50. So we're right outside the top 10. And what, where would we rank if we took staff's recommendation on the faculty increases? So I'll just, just to start with that, Tammy, you want to come on up? Well, this I guess the other schools might be, yeah. <laughs> That's true. This is we've been, we've based. Been, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead, sir. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, please. This is based on a nine-month salary for 21-22 that was at seventy thousand three hundred forty dollars. That did not include the stipends. And actually, we've come up. The, we use mm -hmm. the Texas Community College Teachers Association survey that they uh, complete every fall, and it's published in November. So this past November, we were all, again ranked sixth out of the fifty for average faculty compensation, and last November's average was 72,194. So we're still ranking sixth. Okay. And if other colleges do increase this, so it's just a shuffle, it just depends. Yeah. But this survey is conducted every year, and we see the results around mid to end November. Okay. We've okay. been as high as number five, and we held on to that one for quite a few years. So hovering between five and six has been the past, I gotta say, eight years or so. What does it mean to be in the top 10% for recruitment? It's it in combination with a lot of other things, uh, including tenure. Um, it, so it's a multi kind of variable kind of approach. Uh, it's very attractive. I know we are uh, attracting people from, from other states uh, as well as other colleges currently. Um, shared governance, all of these kinds of things that are not just words here at Del Mar College um, are also variables that attract it. Not, not only, but, as, but, but yes, and especially the, the, uh, the ranking of salaries. Ten, and I'm assuming it helps in, retention, uh, helps in retention as well. Yes, all of the above, all the things that we've been talking about as it relates to faculty um, are all about retaining, recruiting and retaining uh, faculty just as well. Okay, thank you. And I also want to just note the, the tremendous work that the board has accomplished with staff's information in the last 10, 11 years. We were about, about 11 years ago when I first took over compensation and started working with the different employee groups. For faculty, they were, we were at 18. We were ranked 18, I believe it was about 11 years ago. So to, to progress up to six has been a very, very good work by, by the board and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Any other questions? So moving on to goal five, this is workforce development, community partnerships, and advocacy. 
looking at graduation job placement data, licensure and certificate pass rates, and number of industry supported programs. So the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board measures uh, graduate job placement as students found working or enrolled in Texas within one year after earning a degree or a certificate. Now, again, keep in mind, this is only our credit students. This does not include our continuing education students. So in 2020, we had an 80, a little over 85%. We have 17 credit programs that require licensure exams for entry into the professions. So since 2018, our students have had a passing rate of over 91%, and our target for 2024 is going to be 95%. Now, the passing rate for our students have always been, um, it's been really good for many, many years. I'm just using our current strategic plan as a, as a touch point. Now, the third part, the advocacy work. Considerable amount of advocacy work is done at the college by you, our Board of Regents, by President Escamilla, and our staff. As we've talked about at length, Dr. Escamilla and Chair Scott played a pivotal role in the community college finance law just signed by the governor. And we also have other staff members who put a lot of time energy into this. Um, another example is Dr. Leonard Rivera, our Associate VP for Continuing Ed and Off-Campus Programs. He is currently part of that rulemaking committee for the new structure, so uh, no pressure, Dr. Rivera. <laughs> The last goal for the current plan was goal six. Now this one is completely surrounded around our financial capacity and demonstrating that fiscal stewardship that we talked about at the beginning, which is so key when you're doing a strategic plan for a community college. And so I've asked um, Mr. Raul Garcia to come up and touch on that. So good afternoon. Uh, so beginning with the average tuition and fee, uh, on an annual basis, the college will assess the, uh, the tuition and fees with consideration to our district's uh, uh, student population demographics. This includes the district's poverty levels, medium household income, student financial assistance, and the amount of student college loan debt. Our long-term strategy of stable and modest tuition increase helps in part with maintaining our low cost of attendance relative to other large, large size community colleges and the surrounding four-year institutions, while securing the funding uh, needed for student support services, such as the foundation, financial aid office, veteran services office, the math and reading labs, and related technology supports are just a few examples. I have two data points that point to the college's performance with achieving our goal of student affordability. So before I talk about the first data, bo data point, the Texas Association of Community Colleges recently as yesterday reported that Texas community colleges are one of the most affordable in the country, affordable in the country. So keep this in mind when we compare Del Mar's cost of tuition relative to the statewide cost of community colleges in Texas. So the first data point is based on tuition and fees for 15 semester contact hours for the fall as reported by the Texas Higher uh, Education Coordinating Board. With that said, I'm happy to report that the Elmar's tuition and fee for the fall of 2022, $1,690, is significantly lower by 3.2% relative to the statewide cost of tuition and fees of 1744 Not only are we more affordable nationwide, but we are also more affordable than the average cost of tuition of other community uh, colleges uh, in Texas, public community colleges, by the way. The second data point uh, takes into consideration the period of the pandemic from the fall of 2019 uh, to the fall of 2022. So I'm happy to report that the change in the cost of tuition and fees during this period is 3.7%. This rate is significantly low uh, for this period of time when the rate of high inflation peaked for the state of Texas 9.9%. Uh, and this is reported as of June of 2022. 
So again, two data points that points to affordability. Next is scholarships. So there's many ways to measure financial aid award performance, one of which is the average Pell Award rate. The average Pell Award rate reported by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the integrated post-secondary educational data systems are distinctively different. Beginning with the Coordinating Board's average Pell Award rate, you may be familiar with this rate, which is, this is the rate that was reported to you at the last board retreat. It was at a rate of 33%. This can be easily perceived as being a very low, very low based on our district's average income levels and poverty rates for our district. However, this database is grossly misleading because of the factors used in determining this rate. The rate is driven in driven by the number of students enrolled in undergraduate academic programs and dual credit academic programs. There's the rub, as Hamlet said, right? The problem with this uh, rate is that the dual credit students are not eligible, not eligible, different than qualifying. Qualifying is I can go and apply, but because of my income level, I'm not gonna get anything. Well, it doesn't even get to that stage. These dual credit students cannot even submit an application because they're not undergraduate status. So the fact that our dual credit enrollment is at high levels is what's significantly driving our average Pell Award to this low level of 33%. So another downside with this data point is that the information is not released on a timely basis. The coordinating board's most recently re release is from the Almanac 2021 Almanac. The reported average Pell Award is for the 2019, fall of 2019, at 33%. But, and I say big but, however, if we compare this rate to the previous year, I can tell you there's been significantly improvement by 6.1% relative to the fall 20. 18 rate of 30.9%. So we can pretty much gauge our performance improved level just by those two years. Now it's not current, I get it. It includes dual, dual credit, I get it. But because we increased in that rate, that just show, shows that we're getting more student applicants into our financial aid office, qualifying applicants, okay? So I believe the average Pell Award rate reported by I IPEDS is, more is a more accurate performance measure. This rate is based on the first year undergraduate status student enrolled at Del Mar College. This rate excludes students enrolled uh, who are not, this rate excludes students who are not eligible to participate in the Pell program such as our dual credit students. Based on the 2021-2022 year, the average Pell Award rate uh, demonstrates that we improved uh, in terms of performance uh, by 10% uh, to the current Pell Award rate of 67% from the previous year's rate of 6.61%. All right, moving on to the points three, two, Five, six, seven. I'm going to tell okay. you now, if you read us more statistics, I'm going to shoot you. You got it. <laughs> I'm sorry? No more statistics? We're good? Well, okay. It, we're well, well, no, well, what I'm saying is that I, I, I appreciate the data, but it is really hard for me, I don't know about the other board members, to listen to data points like that yes, and not have that information in front got of me it. or have the opportunity to absorb it. So I'm not doubting anything that you're saying, but it would be very, very helpful if that information was provided to us as part of the packet. We don't have to go over it in detail uh, at every board meeting, but if you're going to provide those kind of statistics, I, I, numbers, hearing numbers does not do me uh, so just, that's me. So what maybe, I caught, sure. what, what, what I caught the point of that was is that when we talked about the low number of students who got Pell, you went back and looked at the data, and the low number of students who got Pell, and the reason why our data point on the KPI is going down is because the Pell percentage includes dual credit students who aren't allowed to get Pell, and when you pull right. those students out, 
our percentage of students who can get Pell is going up, but it w the metric was going down because the number of students we serve that are doing dual credit has been going up, right? Uh, close. Both <laughs> metrics indicate performance level has improved. Okay. But uh, the 33 percent is misleading because it includes dual credit, whereas the iPads uh, excludes dual credit. But in both indicators, suggest improvement in our performance. Okay, great. Thank yes. You. But yes, I, th I, think, I think it would have been better to talk about that in the statistic portion of the event, because yeah. that's very hard to understand when you're not looking at the number. Thank right. you, Mr. Garcia. And the, uh, one of the goals of having uh, Mr. Garcia come up and talk about goal six was really to point to um, the ratios that we are meeting above and exceeding at the state level, which is including the tuition fee and fees compared to the other institutions uh, two years here in the state of Texas, which Roel referred to, um, the state standard for primary reserve ratio and our viability ratio. And so these are all things that we're excelling at, but again, that we include in the strategic plan um, as we watch carefully to make sure that we are fiscally responsible to our taxpayers and our students, faculty, and staff. So I don't believe you have any other questions on this one. I do. When, when you bring this information back in September, if we're going to do a dive based on the new numbers in September, yes. then I think provide, again, some of this in, uh, in, a, in, in charts or in an addendum report so that we can read it and then we can talk about it in the presentation at the board meeting. But um, I think it's, it's going to be important to, for example, make sure we have defined for the new board members what these ratios are. We don't have to cover it all in a board meeting, but you need to provide that definition so there's an understanding of what that means. Great. Um, thank you. We will do that in, sept in October report, for, September. Uh, for the year four report. Okay. I've got a question. Yes. All right. I, I mean, I heard Raul talk about how we're less expensive than other junior colleges, but I'm looking at one of the charts provided. It's on 100 and, page 110. And it says that our average tuition for 15 semester hours in 2022 was 1690. Our cohorts, the other large colleges, was 1660 or less. And when we compared to all community colleges, they were 1550. Did I misunderstand what was being said? Well, I, I share the chair's uh, <laughs> views that I, I would need to take a look at the data information that you're looking at. I don't have it in front of me, but there is uh, a possibility that it all depends on what data you're looking at, right? A good example is I spoke to you about two data points, one from iPads and one from uh, the uh, coordinating board. And so there's differences, and we can explain that. Uh, and I just think I went through that. And so, but I really need to understand what that source of information to give so, you an explanation. So usually, where that's the case is when you're talking about um, cost of uh, total expense, total cost, total of affordability. By that way, oh. um, if they were using different numbers or so forth, I know. That, uh, like like you're saying, without it in front of you, you can't say. But 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 we do. We are more affordable overall when it comes to semester to semester or time to completion for the students. In other words, they take less debt. They, they you know, they'll do those kinds of things. We are uh, more affordable in that way. I don't know if that's the number you were referring to or not, but uh, we will clarify. Yeah. Well, what concerns me is mm -hmm. when I hear uh, Mr. Johnson say that the impact of the 2% increase um, on the college's budget was 65,000 or negligible, so negligible that he didn't include it in his presentation. Um, and then I, I see a chart where we are higher than our cohorts, uh, the average of our cohorts um, in tuition. And, and I'm wondering whether it was worth doing the damage to low income um, students to increase the tuition by 2% when it had a negligible effect on our budget $65,000, um, and we may be above the average of our cohorts. Again, the student charges are relative to, when, when you're comparing ourselves to other colleges also, um, the, the students are, they're, they're having very different experiences. I mean, and so that, that's where the number is, 
where the numbers are kind of uh, will 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 we'll lead you in different directions. And and, and I, I guess so. So. What am I trying to say? So when you compare yourself to most other colleges, even in South Texas, they're all residential. Mm -hmm. They have different costs. They have different experiences. They so where we may be charging. Um, com comparably slightly more, about $100 more or something like that, the students will be incurring. That, that's, that's just tuition and fees. Okay. That, and that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so, so it, 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 we're, we're not all the same, even, even if we're not, even if we're a little higher on that regard, our students, I think, are overall um, it is more affordable to come to Del Mar College than it is at any residential institution in the area. I, can, I, I, I think that is a pretty safe assumption. So there are all kinds of other associated costs with living 24-7 at, at, at an institution versus not now. Um, and, and again, these are all average, and even within those places like Laredo and Coastal Bend and yeah. Southmost and so forth, they have commuter students as well, and you can compare them to that maybe and get some, and, and, and that's where we would probably be, we could possibly be a little bit more uh, on average for the students. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Mr. Kelly, I now understand, I'm also looking at page 110, I understand what your question is. Understand that whenever we're dealing with financial numbers, they're very fluid, and so at one point, at, 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 at the time when this was reported, 1,500 could have been a snapshot several months ago, I can tell you the number I'm giving you today was based on the report that I uh, pulled out this weekend. And so that average number could have changed very easily. But it is a third party source document. It's also the Texas Community Higher Education Community Board. It's almost equivalent like today I'm giving you some numbers for the budget and it's gonna change by the time we get to the workshop, right? Numbers are fluid. So, uh, that's the explanation that I have for you. I do see the $1,550, mm -hmm. but this report is coming out of a report that I generated this weekend, and that number is $1,744 for the average cost of tuition for Texas public community colleges college-wide. Okay. I hope that helps. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Mr. Garcia make, does make a good point and that it can be the challenge of some of this reporting is that right now you're getting a year three report. So this is fall of 21 and spring of 22. And so in October, the idea is, is the coordinating board will be caught up by then. There have been some challenges, I believe, when y'all went in December to the, um, to the CAT conference, the coordinating board conference that you heard that the coordinating board was having some challenges staying up to date with staffing and so their information was a little bit behind and so our staff is currently getting those numbers so in october the idea is that you'll get that comprehensive snapshot again for year four of the current strategic plan so in going through those are the six goals of the current plan some of the snapshots that we provided you were areas that we are doing well at, that we're, again, we're moving the needle, that you're seeing the green in the charts. These, this is the continued work, because we know there's a lot of things that we still need to focus on. For example, overall completion rates, right? Um, our enrollment, uh, full-time enrollment. Again, the idea that if a student goes full-time, that they'll be able to finish quicker and there'll be less things in their life that get in their way. However, a lot of our students want to stay part-time and the challenges that come with that. Uh, we still have a lot of those first time in college students um, that are in developmental education. Now, again, with uh, the FTIC student in fall of 21 and spring of 22, we had about 844 students that are considered FTIC. So again, that is just a snapshot. Um, and then also we want the amount of time for students to pass the TSI and be college ready to shorten. So. There's still several targets that we are still trying to move forward with in this strategic plan. Now, over the past two or three years, you've heard the different initiatives that we have been working on as a college to move all of these individuals forward. 
Um, you've heard about, in May, you heard about a Campus Works from VP uh, Patricia Dominguez, which is going to be our SEM consultant. Since COVID, things have changed drastically for us when it comes to enrollment, recruitment, and persistence. Things are just changed. So we're hoping that through that consultant, we'll be able to look at some different um, ways to move that to move that forward. Um, you've heard about Motomatic in our advising and registration and the efforts to regain our stopouts. Um, we've also been working with different, um, different organizations like the Texas Workforce Solutions um, to help with childcare. There's a lot of different initiatives that are going on that you've been hearing about over the past few months that really coincide with what has come out of this current strategic plan and the work that still needs to be done. Does anybody have any questions on the current plan? Uh, I, I had some uh, questions on the on the data. Um, I, I saw that like our uh, our completion rates on dual credit uh, for classes are higher than our general population, and I was wondering if is is that because there is it's it's easier to deliver, you have fewer dropouts because of life, or is there a difference in uh, who the students are socioeconomically that can explain that difference? Do we have any idea on that? VP Dominguez, do you want to answer that? I have an answer, but I'll let the content expert answer. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm happy to say that the relationship that the ISDs have with the Del Mar faculty coincide with all the ISDs having a content area expert guide the students through their curriculum, their college curriculum. So for instance, we have a huge dual credit online enrollment with our faculty, but they have a content area expert, an ISD person who's typically credentialed in that area that helps the student with the online experience. Same thing that if the student were, you know, we have uh, instructors that are, that go to the high school or we have a high school that has credentialed staff that are eligible to teach our, our, our college level courses. They are coordinating with our chair. They are working uh, with our dual credit staff to assist the students in persistence. Okay. So that's that's why they're very successful. Because I mean that is, that is a pretty significant difference in completion yes, on sir. courses. So I, I I hope we look at that and learn from it uh, because I think that helps us with all the other targets. I mean I I, th I think it's an example of we have good partnerships that we need to expand. Um, we we okay. have annual meetings with uh, the facilitators and with our um, our department chairs and the contacts in, the, in those various departments that work on you know, the, era, the things that have come up with, the things that have transpired in the academic year, and we do that every year. Okay, great, thank you. I think you are bringing up a good point, though, about the difference in our student population, and we have different niches of students you know, who are academically prepared in different ways, so I think there's definitely something to be said for that as well. Yeah, I mean, I. Mm -hmm. I I'd like us to check on that because, I mean, it, it is such a significant gap. Um, it leads you to believe maybe we aren't, we aren't penetrating far enough on dual credit to get all the students we need to get, but, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know because, I mean, if, it, if it's just a significantly better way to ensure completion, then I think that tells us strategically we need to go that way and try to get them even more so when they're in high school because it, it appears that, I mean, we get much higher completion rates when, mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're doing it dual credit versus waiting for them to get out. Um, yes, sir, we'll definitely look into that. I, I don't, are you following, like, are we going through each of these line by line here? Am I jumping ahead? No, go ahead. Okay, um, hold on. All right, that, that's what I've got for now, sorry. Okay. Any other questions before we move into the next plan? So this is now moving into the 2024-2029 strategic plan development. 
And so can, I believe we have several of our committee members. Can you just please stand and be recognized? There's several in the audience. Thank you so much. We've had about 25 uh, committee members on the Strategic Plan Steering Committee who have been working extremely hard for this semester. Uh, we began organizing and getting all of the requirements done to have phase two completed by the spring and the end of the summer so that you could um, see the work that has been done through the calendar. This was given to you in September and approved in September and then again in February. When I showed this to you in February, we had one check under phase one planning. So you can see all the work that's been done today and especially um, Ms. McQueen gave us the, uh, the 88th legislative recap. But again, you saw the depth of what's ho happening in higher ed right now. So it's gonna take several months with us and Mary to really go through and see how that's going to affect the next strategic plan. So the check marks represent completion and what the committee has been focused on, uh, specifically finishing focus groups and analyzing data that we have received so far. So we're currently finishing up phase two and we're looking into what phase three looks like. We have had so much fun as a steering committee. The best part about phase two in that launching that env environmental scan has been two parts. It has been uh, focus groups with all of our stakeholders internally and externally, but it has also been surveys that were put together by the steering committee as well. So this list, just a, a list to show you of all the sta different stakeholders that we have, that we have either been in focus groups with or have finished a survey. And in the first external focus group where we had community stakeholders, we had Regent Garza and Regent Loeb there. And I don't know if you wanted to comment on your experience there with the group that day. You wanna go for it? I, I, I would say the thing I came, you know, I, Rudy and I observed, we didn't really, we tried not to participate. Um, uh, which, as you might imagine, was tough for me. Uh, but uh, for me too, uh, and, and for me too. Uh, I, I would say the 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 largest takeaway I had was there were a huge number of good ideas that the members had that we already have, and this was our external. This wasn't general public. This was our external stakeholders. And I, I would say 70% of the ideas were excellent ideas that we've already instituted, that they just did not know that we did. And so um, uh, there, were, there were other good ideas, particularly on dual credit from the CCISD folks, um, but uh, I, I think everybody had a good time, but that, that was the takeaway I had driving away was, uh, we're already doing a lot of this stuff, we just need to tell people that we're doing it. And, and bring them into our um, uh, our process on doing it. Um, there were some other things that you know I think will end up being on the list that were great ideas, but that was that was my big takeaway. Thank you, Regent Lope. Yeah, that was the same experience I had too. Uh, they all had great ideas. A lot of them we've already started working on. Uh, some things they talked about. This would be great if you had this. And those are things that we've already seen at the national level, some of the conferences that we've attended. Um, from the CCISD, there were, as I talked to Dr. Scamilla just this afternoon when we were having lunch, there still seemed to be some disconnect that, that I know that, they're, that we're working on in terms of related, how do we transition, make sure that the transcripts are transferred to the college in the easiest way possible so that students, when they're looking to try to get admitted or try to take the classes they want to sign up for, don't get frustrated and then just walk away and give up. And so again, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that our, that our connections are, are firm, right? So that we yes, sir. were able to make things easier and more, we'll say, uh, transition, e the transition easier for, for the students so we capture everybody we possibly can. But I, I think that that exercise is, is great. I don't really think, uh, and I think that there's gonna be some future exercises in, turn, in terms of community outreach. So I encourage when, where you can to, to get uh, um, some of the other regions involved so they can also experience the same 
kind of positivity that we, we experienced. Thank you. So it has been really exciting, but you can imagine what Regent Loeb and Garza talked about as a staff member who works day in, day out, and is very passionate about their work to hear about things that need to be done that they've been doing for years. And so our goal um, as a committee has really been to listen. You know, even if somebody says something that we're already doing or that we already know may not work, again, right now we are just being open to listening to what the community is telling us, what our students are telling us. We have had fabulous focus groups. We have had uh, focus groups with so many of our different students, students who are, are here for transfer, students who are CE students. We had a really great focus group with students who are parents. And um, in August, I would really like to, at that point, be able to give you all of the analysis and show you what all of our trends have been. Right now, we really are at the beginning stages. So in August, we will come back to you and give you a full report on what was said about that. These are some of the things that have just come up preliminarily. This is focus groups, but we've also done surveys. And we were so proud to, to see that we had over 900 students complete the student survey portion. And so we're really excited to dig into that analysis, which you'll see in August. But again, some of our strengths, right? Our student services came up big. All of the support that's being uh, done by VP Dominguez and her team. Um, the advocacy, people are seeing your advocacy out there, the administration, the board. Uh, continuing education is big. Um, some of the challenges, this is big and I think uh, Regent Loeb, we heard a lot of this in, at your table too, communication internally and externally. So when I say that we're very excited that VP Olson is here, we are very excited that VP Olson is here to help us with that because yes, we're doing some great things, but how do we get people to know about it without overloading everybody with too much information, right? There's a strategy and a process to that. Child care for students, you're gonna hear more about that in August. This isn't just a Delmar College student problem. This is a problem that's happening all over the city, all over the nation, and what are we going to be able to do as a college to help support our students who are also parents. Some of these opportunities that came up, what Regent Gattas and Regent Loeb mentioned, that K through 12 pipeline, making sure that we're collaborating with them, increased funding from our partners, and that was very specific. We need our partners, we kept hearing over and over again, to help us. We need our partners to provide financial stability back to the college in form of scholarships to the foundation and monies to help our students. Threats, enrollment continues to be a challenge. Um, technology came up, you know, the idea of AI came up and what are we doing with that? And then of course our legislation. Um, I think in our first community group we talked about how um, legislation really can be so challenging for higher education and community colleges. And so what is that going to do for us moving forward into the next seven years at this point? These are the next steps to wrap up phase three. We're going to officially close the survey in July. You're going to see it out here in social media because there's an opportunity if you're a student, a parent, um, a community member to fill that out. Um, we're gonna be completing our data analysis so we can bring that back to you in September. Um, we're going to have a workshop specifically with all of our executive team members so that they can start digging into what we have found and help us structure the plan so that we can deliver, excuse me, deliver that to you, the board in the workshop um, in August and September. Does anybody have any questions about the current plan? I don't have a question. I want to point out the uh, strategic planning workshop for the board will be the morning of August 8th. That'll be our next workshop, and so we'll do that the day of our next board meeting. We'll give you a specific time, but 9 30, 10 o'clock start time, but a couple yes. of hours, two, three hours potentially in the morning of our next board meet, a regular board meeting in August. Thank you. So yeah, but at that point, we'll have analyzed all of the data and we'll be able to give you some, some pretty big chunks of information that you can dive into. At one of our earlier discussions, and, and I've, I've talked to the, the good and the bad of Dr. Escamilla give me, giving me a ride to Austin on uh, Friday was that he got to, we got to talk for six hours, seven hours, and so bless his heart. <laughs> <laughs> But we did have a conversation about, uh, and, and we had talked at the board level about a 
some, some demographic research. And I know you've been looking at uh, some services for a demographer. And so do you, do you, where do you see that potentially, or how do you, is there an opportunity for that to fold into this process, Dr. Escamillo? Yes, Lenore and I have already been talking about that, and we were, I don't know that, I haven't followed up since Friday with her <laughs> on that. Um, but uh, we have some people, we have another agency, weren't we looking for somebody? Do you recall that conversation, Lenora? We were, it was somebody besides Doug Lowe, some, somebody besides who we've used in the past. Yeah, we, in the past, we've used uh, extensive, we've received extensive demographic data out of uh, uh, programming group Doug Lowe, out of, not Doug Lowe, he's the actor. Uh, <laughs> facilities management. Facilities. Thank you, facilities management group. But what's his first name? Doug. Is it Doug? Yes. Doug Lowe and their, their group, and we just need to re-engage with them to get the breakdown that we want in addition to what we already have internally. There was another group out of College Station we were thinking about, um, or it had been at College Station at one point. They were now spun off, so I, you and I need to take a deeper dive. So the answer is to, to, that we, we are clearly not uh, connected with another group outside the ones we've already used. We do want to use a different group, and I think that's what we've talked about. Yeah. Because what part part of what we've heard uh, in the last year and a half around statewide demographics, um, ha there's a big you know big overarching question about how the the state is growing. But it's I think it's very important that we understand our service area and and what is happening. We we get conflicting information based on depending on who you're talking to. So I think just some really focused uh, information about what the next you know, 20 to 40 years look like. Obviously, that's much longer than a five-year strategic plan, but I think as we talk about these things, we have to have a better understanding of what the potential numbers look like in our service area. We will. We'll put it together. Yeah, I, in, in line with that, you know, I, I wasn't sure in, until I, I, I saw uh, Chairman, Chairman Scott yesterday whether we were, whether this meeting was our reviewing our existing performance measures or talking about the new ones or both. But um, one of the things that kind of struck me as I read them is, is some of these KPIs are actually more tracking data type things where I'm not sure, you know, I don't know that I can expect uh, the staff to control what percentage of our students are full-time versus part-time. You know, I don't, I don't know that that is a controllable metric. And so I, I think maybe in part of this discussion is taking some of these measurements and having them be tracking data, not performance data, um, and, and splitting those two things. And then there, there are a couple like on recruitment where we don't have any KPIs at all. You know, we, we don't measure bounce rate off the website, uh, the effectiveness of the, any advertising we do, uh, how many, you know, we don't measure how, how many students we go and see and engage in person and things like that. So I'd hope that like between now and our workshop, we kind of all take some time and think about, you know, what what is reasonable to measure and judge? What, do, what information do we just want to have because we need it for context? Um, and then what are some things that we're not measuring that we should? Yep. So the variables from this plan are clearly, um, I'm, I'm going to say almost as soon as they were printed were, were outdated. And now, especially with the, with, 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 even for us, yep. I mean, they're useful, can be useful. I think they're limited in their use. We, we, we all know <laughs> that. That being said, they were better. Than better nothing. than they were the plan before yeah. and even the plan before that. But that being said, when this board gives us the visionary direction in which to go, the, the, we'll plug in appropriate data. So these KPIs will look very different, uh, and especially as it relates to where we are now positioned with the, with the state through funding. Um, not just funding, but measuring outcomes altogether. And I'd like to point out the snapshot that you see that was an attachment that gives a lot of the data points that that we're referring to, that those data points are basically a year old, if not further, and that they'll be updated hopefully in October. That report was given to the board last October or September. Many of you 
some of you weren't on the board at that time. And so it was attached kind of to give support to this overview presentation as to where we are today. But also what's missing, I think, in the total picture of where we are with assessment and KPIs is that they go all the way down through every program and some of what you're talking about, like for college relations and like ad placement, they do measure those, but we do it at the program level or at the departmental level. They don't reach the strategic planning level or the college-wide institutional level, but they are within our total assessment and our tracking documents. Okay. okay. <clears throat> on, on, on that you. front, you know, one of the things I was kind of interested looking at the completion rate is do we have any data on the difference on completion rate between eight week and full semester classes? Eight week and, you know, our, our short our short courses versus our long courses. We do have this code here. I knew we were gonna we're gonna put some biofeedback to those, mm -hmm. connect those with some measurements. We, I don't know that we Yes, except that when we develop the strategic plan the we eight week courses. Eight -week courses. So in, yes, but in terms of for this data, we don't have. We're not tracking that KPI for the current plan, but we are tracking. I mean, I, I ask that because I I know some some colleges have been looking at do you convert entirely to short course form, and if we you know if if our objective is access and completion, and we've got data that shows you know on on dual credit and eight week courses, there's significantly higher completion rates. We need to have that. That is That's a strategic. The, those are the visionary kinds of things that we need to talk about and, 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 and so forth so that, so that we, as we are comparing to other places and so forth, we've been, we've been ramping up. Dr. John has been waiting to say something. Yes, we have worked with institutional research to get the data on how many students, what percentage are passing the eight week versus the traditional 16 week format and we're looking at the withdrawal rates, everything. So we have a team, an eight-week team, you could say, and we're looking at all the data and seeking more. Okay. So we are doing that actively. Great. Yes. Those Thank are you. those big picture kinds of things that we're going to need to hear from you. Thank you. And I will end with that, uh, Regent Loeb. One of the things that has also come up in our discussions is a five-year strategic plan can be very challenging. So that if the next plan can be structured more in a three-year, year-to-year, and then the five more of the overarching goals, because we are changing and moving so quickly from year to year, that, um, like Dr. Escamilla said, as soon as this plan was written, it was almost outdated. And I think that's something that we can address for the next plan. I would like to ask, uh, prior to the August 8th meeting, um, if you have uh, the structure for that workshop, whether it's a, an overarching agenda or here are, are the big questions or here are the big topics, if there's data that you want us to absorb prior to that, um, let's, let's think about the advanced work um, that the board we don't, I'm not asking for homework, but I just, I'd, I'd like a little bit more than three days notice if there's gonna be big picture questions and how you want that structured or how we're gonna structure that. I think it would be helpful for those of us to spend a little bit of thought time that we might have this summer. Uh, we're gonna be thinking a lot about the budget <laughs> between now and, and July, or you are gonna be thinking a lot about it, but, but we've got a little bit of time. So as soon as you can give us here's the big topics or here's the kind of input we're going to want from you. Give us that with more than, than just our traditional agenda notice um, so that we can, can really put those thoughts together. Because again, David was asking me yesterday, do I bring this up now? Do I bring it up later? Or when do I bring it up? And so all of us have had thoughts over the last year about um, what, what are those big visionary, what are those big topics? And so if we, we know how it's structured, it'll help us prepare for that. Next, the workshop we're bringing in Martha Ellis. Correct. On, in August. In August eighth, right? right? Okay. Just make make sure. Just want to put her name out there to make sure that we're and and the idea with her. So I could just go ahead and start planting seeds now. Was uh, to move towards a, a a vision statement and or concept from this board to get one step closer, if not complete it. So that's different, so that there's a couple things going on here, so we need to think about it just by way of logistics for timing and so forth, so. 
we can change it. Like you no, said, we I, have time. My point is, is that we need to know between now and August what you want that August, yep. what, is, what is helpful within your process, but we also need time to bring those big ideas forward. Yep. And if that's the time to do it, then gotcha. let's structure the agenda at the, at, in that appropriate way. Yep. And we want to hear information, we want to respond to it, but we also need to know when, when are we bringing yep. those big ideas forward. Okay. Thank you. Ooh, that was some good information over the last couple of hours. <laughs> um, Tammy, professional contract review. Maybe this one won't take that long. Hit, hit, right? <laughs> <laughs> you never take long on this one, so I'm just going right. to. Thank you. you. This is our semi-annual review. The last time we reviewed the professional contracts list was last December. So we color code the activity. So the activity that's uh, highlighted um, is something that has shifted since last December. So we'll go through the yellow. So the yellow means it is expiring in 23. So it's already expired. So let, we'll go and do the yellow first. It's Port Enterprises that was some roofing projects that ex, is expiring August 1st. So that's the only one we show that has pretty much expired. Um, we have blue. So blue means that there's been some type of date adjustment since it was last presented to you. So for example, we have um, Gensler Turner Armidas, this is for the um, Oso Creek campus that has been extended into 24. So that has been extended to next year, that contract. And then we also have uh, ABM Industries, that contract also had a date change and it was approved in 22. Um, contract was finalized recently and that contract um, maximum extension date was changed to December, excuse me, October of 27. So those had a little bit of a date adjustment. So we have a couple that had a date adjustment, but they're also are gonna be um, expiring. If you see in the orange, they would have already expired, but I'm presenting it to you because we did do a date adjustment. So if you want to look at Fulton Construction, this is for package two for OSO, that um, would have expired actually this summer, but that has been moved to the end of December of this year. And then also for command commissioning, um, it also would have expired this summer, but it has been moved and will expire in, in December of this year. So they are expiring, but we did change the dates of their expiration, but it's kept it in the same calendar year. Okay. We also have, um, we do have one that I need to note. It's the, under the 14 bond, the second line, doing business as victory, um, that, was set to expire in March. We are working on an extension. Uh, John Strybos is working on that and that will be extended to sometime in the fall. Don't have an exact date right now, but that, that is extended to sometime in the fall. That will be updated for you at next review. And then anything in green is something that's brand new to the list for, versus when it was presented in December. So we have Spa Glass contractors. Um, their contract is new, board awarded that. In February, that is for the renovations to the memorial classroom building and then Marshall was awarded a contract by the board in February of 23 also and that is for the Windward Campus Emergency Response Training Facility Improvements. Any questions? Seeing none, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, looking at our uh, pending item list, um, we are going to have an audit committee. So that internal audit report to the board in July, is that the audit committee or is that a, um, is that gonna be part of our special meeting in July? No ma'am, what we've done is the um, committee will meet in July, but then the full report to the board won't be until the August 8th board meeting. They asked gotcha. to move it. They had conflicts on the 25th since our July board meeting shifted. So they have asked to move that to the August 8th board meeting, gotcha. the, the report to the board. Okay. And then we have a regular financial and quarterly investment reports. We have a coordinating board strategic plan uh, update. So let's look and see if that's still is that still appropriate for August, September? September, probably. probably okay. Uh, and then um, you have another process update, which is on your calendar for October. We do need to talk about the, was it the October board meeting? That, um, 
that's calendaring, but conflicts with the ACCT conference. Um, so we'll need to look at the date for the October board meeting. Let's just keep that in mind and, and have some, um, think about that, yeah, yeah. All right, anything else, any questions on pending business? Uh, if not, then we will move on to our consent agenda. We have uh, minutes and acceptance of investment and financials uh, as consent agenda items one, two, and three. Do any of those items need to be pulled for separate consideration? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Agenda? Thank you, Mr. Krul. Is there a second? Second by Dr. Adami. Is there any public comment on our consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the consent agenda, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign, that motion passes. Thank you. Uh, we have one item on our regular agenda, which is discussion and possible action related to increasing tuition on continuing education courses. Uh, Ms. Lenore Keyes and Dr. Leonard Rivera are gonna present that for us. Thank you very much, Regents. Uh, Dr. Rivera is going to present the details on this presentation, but what we're coming to you today is really in preparation of the transition that's going to occur coming out of this legislative session in finance and recognizing the importance, the continued importance of continuing education and really the transition and changes that are going to have to take place over the next year. I'd like to also point out that Dr. Rivera is going to give you data on the variation of pricing and structure for continuing education. It's very different than credit. And that credit, tuition, and fees, even though we use the term tuition and fees or tuition, it, the, the way it's calculated and based is different. This is more on a cost basis and a reimbursement just to cover cost. And so you're not going to see a presentation that is asking for a per dollar amount, it's asking for a percentage amount because the percentage of a $5 class versus a $200 class would not be fair to say a dollar figure. So I just want to point that out as you see the data and the information that Dr. Rivera is going to provide. But this truly is, is looking at the cost and how we cover cost and then also how we meet the needs moving forward as we match up with the new legislative session. Dr. Rivera. Thanks, Ms. Keyes. Appreciate that. Good afternoon, Regents, Madam Chair, Dr. Escamilla. I uh, wanted to uh, present uh, some information uh, for your consideration. Um, as Ms. Keyes has pointed out, we're looking at um, a proposed tuition increase for the 23-24 uh, fiscal year, and this is all related to increased cost. Uh, it's costing more money to buy supplies. I could use the example in our construction uh, programs, a uh, piece of lumber, or a sheet uh, of lumber, I should say, plywood, a couple of years ago cost about $27. Now, today, it cost almost double, um, about $52. And so it's it's gone up dramatically, almost 100% in some cases. Uh, in our healthcare programs, uh, very similar situations. Uh, costs for uh, syringes, uh, needles, and other things that we use for training purposes have just gone up so much uh, in recent years. And so, uh, uh, other things that we want to make sure that we emphasize is that we want to, at all costs, maintain affordability. And I will demonstrate that to you uh, in the uh, next couple of slides to show you exactly how affordable we still will be, even with the proposed uh, increase in uh, tuition cost. Also, want to make sure that we optimize um, our metrics for the new funding model or under the new funding model. Obviously, uh, you know, there's still a lot to be said. Uh, rulemaking committee still in progress, at least for the emergency rulemaking process. Uh, should have some more information by mid-July, as Dr. Scamay has pointed out. Uh, then we go into the regular um, rulemaking process that will start almost immediately in August. And so there will also be more discussion and uh, processes will probably be revised if necessary. And so there's still things that would be worked out in the next couple of months. Uh, we also want to make sure that we develop and optimize a measurable skills gain a mechanism. Uh, obviously, with the new uh, funding model, it's all going to be about performance uh, funding or performance outcomes, as 
to say. And so we want to make sure that we develop a model uh, in-house that will uh, easily allow us to um, uh, produce those measurable outcomes and also optimize the funding that comes with all those outcomes. We want to also make sure that our CE courses matriculate into level one, level two, the social degree programs. We've done uh, start work on this already. This is something that we're not doing now. It's something that we've been doing for some time already. But with this new funding model, it's going to uh, cause us to uh, push this envelope even more so. And that's a good thing, in my opinion. And so we're ahead of the curve, in my opinion. And I think, in my opinion, I would dare say, Dr. Scamilla, we're uh, the model for the, the state and really for the nation. That's what we're doing in CE at this point in time. Uh, we also want to expand more on-ramp opportunities for all students. Uh, we service all types of students, those students that have uh, no diplomas, uh, no GD to those that have some, and they come back for finishing school purposes. They have a degree maybe, and their degree is in an area that doesn't garner any type of uh, you know job or marketable uh, successful job, and so they come back say, I want to look at maybe becoming a mill writer or I want to become a nurse. And so they come back and retool up for that purpose. Um, and then we want to make sure that uh, we continue our relationships with our uh, faculty. And this is something that I, I really have an honor to, to work with Dr. Halcom. Um, and all the deans uh, here in this uh, uh, college and faculty, we have really forged a strong relationship with our academic uh, fellows. And uh, I can assure you that uh, this new funding model is going to allow us to really forge closer um, in getting some uh, new ideas on the plate and really uh, getting them out there and really being more uh, proactive than reactive. And of course, uh, moving forward to develop a new modified tuition and program offering structure under, new, uh, under the new funding model to optimize performance outcomes. And that's going to be so important because whatever we do and how we form our new program offerings, we want to make sure that there's going to be outcomes associated with every milestone that a student achieves. And so that's going to be so important. And that's how we're going to be graded for all practical purposes. So to be very specific, uh, proposal is approve a 10% tuition increase for continuing education courses. There will be no increase for the commercial truck driving or license, licensing program right now. So that was done last June. So again, no tuition increase for CDL programming. Justification, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, we have increased programmatic costs, material supplies, instructional costs in order to Recruit good talent, we've got to pay uh, the market price. Uh, right now, we have uh, challenges in recruiting um, nurses for our CE programs. And so we're competing against the market, hospitals, clinics, you name it. So um, we need to pay um, in order to retain those, those talents. And then obviously, we look at, we did this last year at the Higher Education Price Index. Right now, it's currently at 8.3%. So asking for a 10% increase is right in line with that uh, HEPI uh, increase that is stated. Here is a quick, I know it's kind of hard to see, but uh, hopefully the regions, you have your screens there. You can look at this more closely. Uh, you can see the, um, um, I know it's a little too close now, but uh, you can see how we are currently uh, structured and then the uh, proposed increase on the next column over, um, if Zach could move over a little bit, there you go, thank you Zach, uh, you can see the uh, outcome of the 10% increase. So we run it up to the nearest whole dollar, so uh, you might notice that there's some little deviations there, but it's 10% and then we uh, run it up to the nearest dollar. If it was a cents, we kind of run it out up there. So it's, you're going to see it's, it's, it's uh, very uh, in parity with uh, inflation and in parity with the higher education price index. Thanks, Zach. All right, let me go to the next slide. There we go, I don't know if I went too far to go too far. Okay, some continuing education uh, comparisons. This is very important because we want to make sure we demonstrate that we are affordable, even with the 10% increase proposed. So you look at Dallas College, you look at Del Mar College with a 10% increase. Again, uh, just looking at CNA, still highly affordable, $850 compared to their $1,050. Um, ours is a 144-hour program, theirs is a 100-hour program. And you can look at some of the other uh, lists there. And so we get under, compared to Dallas College, which is a lot larger than we are, highly affordable in our opinion. Next one is Austin Community College. 
Again, you'll see that uh, pretty much in parity with them. Uh, we may be higher in a couple courses, but in general realities, we still are very much in, um, very in line with their price structure. In some cases, you're gonna find that uh, it's not apples to apples. Uh, most other colleges offer their programs in a different format, different hours. Um, so it's, it's, we try to get to the uh, mist, the gist of it there, but this is as close as we could get to those uh, parity comparisons. Next slide is Laredo College. Again, highly affordable. We're looking at medical building and coding, EKG, patient care technician. Uh, in this case, we're below uh, even Laredo College as far as affordability and cost. So last slide is, again, a recap, uh, a proposal to approve a 10% tuition increase for CE courses. Again, no increase for CDL. And again, as I mentioned earlier, justification is on the uh, uh, the uh, programmatic cost increase, instructional cost increase, and then the justification on the HEPI uh, index of 8.3%. Any questions? I've got questions. Yes, sir, Mr. Kelly. Yes, Regent Kelly, yes. All right. Uh, I heard you say we're not going to increase the um, commercial driver's license because yes. they got bumped in 20, June of 22. Correct. I'm seeing in the presentation that um, we had a general increase of 10.2 percent in June of 20. Correct. That, that is correct, Regent. Of all the other programs. Yes. That, yes, sir. So if we do another 10 percent, that'd be 22 uh, percent if you compound it, or 21 percent if you compound it over two years. Uh, do we have a breakdown of how much we're subsidizing? the uh, dual credit courses out of our general budget as opposed to the tuition that these students are paying? How, how, how did we arrive at 10% um, two years in a row? Well, in last year, again, it was uh, based on the, uh, uh, basically our, our CPR, or the Higher Education Price Index. Before that, we had not increased tuition for probably the preceding five years. And Mesquite, I don't want to take the words. You want to, okay. And so, um, and so that was an adjustment we made, uh, you know. And then uh, this year, again, based on this, the continued increase of supplies and equipment uh, to hold the courses, uh, it just, it, it just unfortunately, we're just having to push uh, towards another increase to maintain parity with these costs. So it's just the cost of doing business is really what it comes out to, unfortunately. Uh, it's the best justification I could give you uh, to rationalize why we have to go up 10%. Okay, so I'm, so. I'm hearing that um, we did it last year because the higher education price index increased. Does that mean that was the cost of providing or, or buying the materials that we needed for the course? What, what is the higher education price index? What does that represent? Good question. So it's it's an index that has been established uh, for, for I would say about since the 90s, and what it does is it looks at uh, uh, universities and colleges, and it looks at uh, tuition, uh, not, uh, actually staff cost. It looks at other operational costs associated with uh, uh, program programs and facility costs. So it's not a perfect index, but it's an index that. Uh, could be utilized to gauge um, uh, or justify an increase. It also is also uh, compared to the uh, consumer price index as well. So CPI and the HEPI kind of go in hand in hand, and they're usually off only by a couple, maybe half percent or so. So it's a very closely intertwined. I use the HEPI only because it's really specified for higher education purposes, as opposed to the consumer price index, which is not. So does so, our, our data at the college correspond with what we're getting here uh, from the higher education price index or do we know what our increased costs are for providing these courses this year as opposed to last year that's part of the challenge in that as you see the variation in courses and as you see the comparative to the other colleges across the state they're all over the place really I did notice that yeah. yes and and so that's part of the challenge in that some are very expensive we've looked at uh, the cost per course and if we came back to you with an analysis of a course per course it would be all over the place uh, but what we're proposing because of the what they're going to do to realign 
to meet the new legislation is they're going to be looking at it and looking at how to combine courses over this next year based upon an outcome and that cost basis is going to be completely reallocated. And so the decision was instead of going course by course and where you'd have large increases in some areas and very small increases in others that we were looking at a moderate to modest increase across the board now to, so that we could position ourselves to move forward. Okay, but I mean, we're, we're talking about 21% in two years. Uh, not That seems a little more aggressive than moderate. One of the other things too, uh, up until this point, uh, Regent Kelly, is that um, the, this is a different um, revenue source. We're changing it. Um, but 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 the, where the prices were, remember, we, we have not been receiving state aid for this, for these uh, for these programs, and so that's a different reason. So it's it, it now moving forth, we we will be and so forth. So I think there will be a reset once once the state starts um, funding um, and and otherwise supporting continuing education classes and so forth. But until then. Um, uh, this we are out on our own on this. This is between us and the customer, so to speak. I've, I've just got two concerns. One is, and, and I think the optics are concerning. We, the first part of this meeting, the, it was emphasized over and over again how the, the state, the legislature, and the governor were emphasizing the um, requirement that these dual credits be affordable. And in the same meeting, we're asking for a 10% increase in our tuition for the second year in a row. Um, it seems uh, to fly in the face of what the state is is trying to do. Um, and second, uh, um, this is one of the emphasis. This is where we're, we're, we're trying to get more students. We're trying to emphasize getting dual credit students and 10% um, increases two years in a row seems to be counterproductive. Well, Mr. Kelly, if I, if I can add, uh, interject here, is you know, part of the uh, coordinating board's job is, to, is currently working on the rule, making piece of it, but there's also conversation that if we participate in this dual uh, credit grant that's out there, there's gonna be a maximum rate that we can charge. And the example I gave earlier today, if the if 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 uh, the the award is ninety nine dollars, that's the maximum amount that we can charge any dual credit. So whatever changes they may make on their rate, and it's mainly for continuing education, which is a totally different program. But even if our dual credits want to participate in those programs that are equivalent to CE, there's a maximum rate that's required that's gonna be required or mandated if we participate in this dual credit grant. Yep. We, we, need to, be we need to parse out the dual credit students from, from the other adult students yeah. that are gonna be uh, paying for this. So there's two different, two different classifications okay. and so forth. Those will be monitored and capped and so All forth. Right. So dual credits will be excluded from, um, uh, w w by way of a cap once we receive that information from rules making. So right. that'll, 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 that that'll, helps. That that helps. That'll. Yeah, but also, go back to that the, the list of all of the, yeah. I mean, you're, the, you're, this is continuing education. You know, a lot of these people are, are going in there to improve their skill set. Yeah. And so uh, they pay a little bit more, but they improve their skill set to where they're going to get more in salary when they come out. No, I was equating dual credit and continuing education. That was, was well, well, a lot of my heart, and, heartburn was coming from. Well, and there's, and there's the CE part that, mm -hmm. that, that the students will take in high school that's not technically, in, some, in, in many ways, dual credit, although they are earning credit. It, it, it's, there, there, there's different components once they're in dual credit, but the high school students that have need will be protected from. We're not office. talking about them. No. Yeah. Okay. That. No. That makes me feel better. Yeah. Sorry. That that, that needed to be clarified. But, I apologize. I but some of these, to get a, a degree or certification, or do some of these have to take like English and other? No. Sir. No. No. These are just. 
strictly skill building skill courses. building courses. Yes. Correct. Okay. And to give you an example of the cost, uh, what we're paying for skilled labor right now are skilled instructors. Um, in carpentry, forty to forty-five dollars an hour for the instructor, and it's gone up from twenty-five dollars an hour in the last two to three years. And in nursing, it's gone up from $25 an hour to $35 an hour, and that's in one year. And so we didn't go program by program, but just to give you some examples of what we're having to pay out in the market to hire these instructors, um, it's quite a bit. No, I'm, yeah. I'm, I feel better about it right now. Okay, thank you. Mr. Loeb has a question. Uh, so on these, when it, when it talks about hours, that's classroom hours not course hours right yeah it's contact hours okay, okay. so EK, hours. ekg you get your ekg course in six eight hour days 48 hours yes that, okay. that's, yes All right. correct that's correct. uh and so that cost is the cost for the whole course yes okay um i i'd like us to like not have tuition discussions on credit and ce separately from now on I think it's important to have that conversation together. And I would be very much interested in some analysis from you all about what is, subs you know, what is, what is getting tax-based subsidy and what is not, to what extent, you know? And I, and I know that's incredibly difficult. I, it no. sounds simple to say, no, but it's... it can be really hard to do. It, it, it will it'll probably happen more naturally than we realize. We have to get through one more year before we're able to do that because inherent because all of the conversation now that it'll be tied in with state funding and so forth versus it doesn't it's it's it's, it's always been a standalone kind of something we've done all together separately right. right it will be brought in so so stay tuned i think that will be uh the only way we can discuss the overall student charges and we shouldn't say just tuition when we're talking about things we should really speak more generally about student charges so I, yeah i mean it kind of that'll get, happen it kind of gets into my my i guess i made a comment a couple months ago about like why why do why is one credit and why is one non credit it is is it we can't keep the, treat this I, I don't know if it's the subsidized stepchild or the you well, know, I, don't, I don't know if it's the golden child that's get, getting heavy subsidy or it's the stepchild that's so like it, it, it has eat what been, you kill. It has been off the radar. The state is just now building databases now. We've been tracking our own. They've been tracking minimally. This whole law changes everything. Right. So it'll bring it all together, but we still need to get through rules making this year. Because, you know, I mean, we did not, percentage-wise, we did not do anywhere near a 10% tuition increase on credit, um, not even close. I think it was like one or 2% basically. It, it's and a very different market. It's a very, when you're just talking about the adults, pulling out the dual credit students, it is a very different market. The contracts are different. And, and I'll tell you what, corporate mm -hmm. services is even different, even even more entrepreneurial right. by nature and, and so forth. So it, it, is a, it, it is a different facet of the college that that we in which we treat our students there um, fairly, I would say, uh, but differently because there are different expectations, different rules of the game, and and so forth. It is our entrepreneurial arm to get out there and and serve people in a flash. Correct. So it, it's just different, us, but we'll, we'll keep working it together. It will be brought together. You on have. Our side. Thank you. Do you have any ideas of, of how many? people uh, take advantage of these continuing education courses? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, right now, annually, it's about uh, about 8,000 students unduplicated. So it's a pretty good amount we, of students. I think we need to relabel this continuing education thing from tuition to course cost or something, you know, to differentiate it from the other programs we've been trying to rename it at the state also for non-credit i've been we've been not me not only me but many of my colleagues and i've been beating that drum to just change that nomenclature in addition to other things but but the student charges again we will um it will, it'll be a different conversation once, once we yeah. get it all together in time and time it wise with the calendar any other questions on this so staff has made a recommendation to us to uh increase the tuition 
That's the name we're giving it now for continuing education uh, as presented. <laughs> Is there a motion to that effect? So move. Second. M motion by Dr. Dami, second by Ms. Averett. Any other questions? Is there any public comment on this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Appreciate the, yes. the, the work that y'all did. Thank you for your question. Uh, we're, the board is now going to go into closed session. We are going to take off closed session item A. Uh, that will be uh, tabled to our next meeting. So we're going into closed session under Texas Government Code 551.072 for real property de deliberation. Texas Government Code 551.074A1, personnel matters. And Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with legal counsel. Uh, the time is 4.17 p.m. and we'll take just a five-minute break uh, folks to go into our closed session room. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have come back from closed session at 6 10 p.m. There is no action item coming out of closed session for our calendar. Uh, we have a uh, Community College Association of Texas Trustees Seminar later this month in McAllen. Uh, our, we do not have a regular board meeting on July 11th. We will, however, have our budget workshop around noon on the 25th, regular board meeting date on the 8th. And as we mentioned earlier, we're going to have a workshop that morning uh, on our strategic plan and then adoption of our uh, budget, public hearing and adoption of the budget on August 22nd. Uh, for those of you who are new, again, once again, we say that a lot these days, on August 21st is convocation uh, that the board, it's, it's Dr. Escamilla's convocation with his faculty and staff, the kickoff of the new academic year. We are invited as guests to attend, so when you see that, it is not an official board meeting, but if you'd like to attend, then you're welcome to do so. Seeing no other business to come before the board, we are adjourned at 6.11 p.m.